On today's show, I joined the oil rush to an American boomtown. Guess who got rich? People said Wilston, North Dakota would boom for decades. Instead, Michael Patrick Flanagan Smith learned it went the way of every other legendary boomtown. From Ag Web Farm and Journal. While America slept, China stole the farm by Chris Bennett. From SmithsonianMag.com. To combat climate change, researchers want to pull carbon dioxide from the ocean and turn it into rock. From Science Magazine. Scientists evolve a fungus to battle deadly honeybee parasite. From Bloomberg Wealth, a record buyout is just the start as wealthy flee a tax hike. Fear of higher U.S. capital gains tax spurs a Medline sale. Families' private equity firms are preparing a deluge of deals. To make agriculture more climate-friendly, carbon farming needs clear rules from Colorado State University. Axios, America's trillion-dollar concrete bill, is coming due by Felix Salmon. From The Guardian, the scientists hired by Big Oil who predicted the climate crisis long ago. Experts' discoveries lie at the heart of two dozen lawsuits that hope to hold the industry accountable for devastating damage. Cattle are competing against grasshoppers for food in the West's historic drought. The bugs are winning. Madagascar is headed toward a climate change linked famine it did not create from the Washington Post, written by Adam Taylor. From the Associated Press, Des Moines faces extreme measures to find clean water. China has a big plan for post United States Afghanistan and it's worth billions from the Daily Beast by Syed. Fazal E. Haidet. From businessinsider.com, Jeff Bezos says the work life balance is a quote, debilitating phrase. He wants Amazon workers to view their career and lives as a circle. From Newsweek, the best Venmo alternatives to avoid fees. Climate in crisis from NBC News. Mexico water supply buckles on worsening drought, putting crops at risk. JP Morgan eyes Ethereum staking as a fast-growing revenue opportunity. The investment banks has its eyes on ETH 2.0 and what it means for the crypto industry by Matthew DeSalvo from Decrypt. The most exciting story of the day. Solar device generates electricity and desalinates water with no waste brine. Additionally, there is a research paper included. From the Des Moines Register, Terry Branstad, carbon capture investments will drive economic growth in rural Iowa and beyond. From the New York Times, the tech Cold War's most complicated machine that's out of China's reach. A $150 million chip-making tool from a Dutch company has become a leader in the United States' Chinese struggle. It also shows how entrenched the global supply chain is. Air conditioning feels great, but it's terrible for the planet. Here's how to fix that from time. From CNBC, Bezos, Gates back fake meat and dairy made from fungus as the next big alt protein. 
from theconversation.com. Most buildings were designed for an earlier climate. Here's what will happen as global warming accelerates. From the South China Morning Post, as China's foreign currency deposits pass $1 trillion, banks face an unwanted headache and yuan pressure. China's forex deposits hit $1.01 trillion at the end of May, up 35.7% from a year earlier. From United States News, Tribe becomes key water player with drought aid to Arizona. From energyvoice.com, Sinopec builds China's first large carbon capture sequestration project. From CNN.com, oppressive heat continues across the West this week with no end in sight. An in-depth long read from The Guardian, 60 years of climate change warnings, the signs that were missed and ignored. Drought, the end of California's groundwater free-for-all from Mercury News. Long opposed, meters are now measuring farmers' water use in the Golden State. J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs are calling time on work from home. Their rivals are ready to pounce from the Wall Street Journal. In one of the more difficult stories of the day, as Lebanon's crisis deepens, lines for fuel grow and food and medicine are scarce. From Axios, Polk County's water quality investigations are nearly complete by Jason Clayworth. From Reuters, asset owners managing $6 trillion call for global carbon price, Susanna Twidale and Simon Jessup. From Channel News Asia, another take on the same position and story. From USNews.com, new United States rules to protect animal farmers are expected soon. From Politico, Republicans weighing cracking U.S. cities to doom Democrats. GOP officials from D.C. and the states are debating how aggressively to break up red state cities to maximize the party's advantage in redistricting. From NBCNews.com, TikTok is taking the book industry by storm and retailers are taking notice. Book Talk has sent old books back to the top of bestseller lists and helped launch the careers of new authors. Videos with the Book Talk hashtag have been viewed a collective 12.6 billion times. A Suez Canal deal has been reached to free the seized vessel from the Associated Press. Bank of Japan is paying banks to lend in a battle against climate change. From Barron's, LiDAR is the future of autonomous driving. According to them, this company is making it cheaper and better. From Richard Medhurst's newsletter, debunking common myths about Julian Assange. From BBC.com, echoes of 1989 as foreign forces withdraw from Afghanistan. From cbc.canada, more than a billion seashore animals may have been cooked to death in a British Columbia heat wave. San Marino adopts non-fungible token passports by Sam Cooling on sports.yahoo. From Quartz, what we've learned after one month of operating a hybrid office From the Wall Street Journal, almonds swept California farms, then the water ran out. New York begins to move beyond Indian Point. So the final topics that we're going to be discussing here 
are all tied around an article of New York Lake heating up from Bitcoin. So a Bitcoin mining plant is accused of turning a New York lake into a hot tub. It appears to be there are some pieces behind that story as well. With a little bit of help from Your Environment Seattle, shout out Carl, thank you very much. We are going to be trying to get through a little of the technicals about their heating, cooling, and dumping. Those are the stories we're going to be covering today. The show will begin in just one minute. for tuning into today's program. Where would you like to begin? You all are the first viewers of the show, and uh, you can have a bit of pick. I do want to leave the, uh, the Bitcoin story for a little later when more people are here, so that'll be my only uh, democratic plea to you all. Hi, I'm Brad. Nice to see you. We can begin with the boom town story. I joined the oil rush to an American boomtown. Guess who got rich? People said Williston, North Dakota would boom for decades. Instead, Michael Patrick Flanagan Smith learned it went the way of every other legendary boomtown. Life in a modern boomtown is living on the frontier but with a smartphone. Capitalism on crack is the way historian Carl Jenkinson referred to it. Everyone taking what they can get as fast as they can. I spent nearly a year in an oil boomtown, from summer 2013 to winter of 2014. I worked in the Beckon oil patch of Williston, North Dakota. At the time, politicians, geologists, and much of the national media claimed the town would be booming for decades to come. They were all wrong. North Dakota began to boom in the midst of America's forever wars, when technological advancement in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing made a formerly impenetrable seam of crude oil suddenly recoverable. Williston, a rural community in an Indian service area with ties to the Turtle Mountain Chippewa, founded its population ballooning. Most of those coming to town were men looking for work. Much of the hiring by oil field companies was pitched towards veterans, but in the wake of the 08 crash, anyone who could swing a hammer had a shot of landing a job. Williston was swamped by out-of-work carpenters, plumbers, and contractors of every stripe. At the beginning of the boom, many oil field jobs provided signing bonuses, housing, and per diems to the ever-growing migrant workforce, benefits trumpeted by the oil industry, the media, and local lawmakers. By the time I arrived, however, most of the perks had dried up. I wasn't the only guy late to the party. The roads were cluttered with clunkers with out-of-state license plates, 18-wheelers, and construction crews. Under the yawning blue of the endless sky and cradled by rambling waves of prairie grass on either side of it, the busted macadam of Route 2 existed as the most visible, mundane, daily reminder that everything and everyone was overwhelmed. 
the Wilston Job Services office estimated at the time that eight new people were arriving in town every day. It boomed from 12,000 to 30,000 in just a few short years. At one point, the town's mayor claimed it was providing services to 60 to 70,000. Some of the men I worked with were locals, but a great deal were migrant workers, general laborers willing to follow the money, or so hard up that willing didn't enter the equation. Migrant workers had come not only from the heartland, but from everywhere. I lived with a group of Jamaicans and worked with several Congolese immigrants. Several guys I knew had worked at the silver mines in Elko, Nevada, then moved to Williston when the price of silver dropped. I imagine many of them drifted down to Texas to work the Permian once Williston went bust. Before I met them, I thought of these kinds of transient workers as a relic of the Dust Bowl. I didn't know they still existed. Now I think about them every day. I landed a job at a crane rigger under the title 17 hour shifts is the title of this paragraph. I landed a job at a crane rigger and swamper for a company that moved oil rigs. I feel stumped every time I attempt to find an adjective that captures how hard the work was. An average day in the patch runs between 12 and 14 hours, much of it backbreaking. While many oil field jobs require two weeks on and two weeks off, I was on call every day. On days off, I sometimes didn't leave the bed. Just lay there staring up the ceiling, the worry in my belly tightening like a metal coil, waiting for a call from dispatch saying, you're headed out on the gin truck tomorrow, Magic. My longest working day was 17 and a half hours. The longest week I recorded was 95 and a half hours. I once worked 172 hours over the course of 14 days. To the men I worked with, this was unexceptional. It was considered bad form to show how much you were struggling on the job. Guys got run off for looking weak or operating a step behind. I worried over my lack of size, strength, and skill. It wasn't until I'd earned my place in the patch that one of the toughest hands I knew admitted that for the first several months on the job, he used to go home and cry every night. We worked through all kinds of weather, from the 99 degree Fahrenheit dog days of summer to deep into North Dakota's bracing winter storms, the coldest that I ever worked was negative 38 degrees Fahrenheit. I was never provided cold weather gear by the company that I worked for, although I asked for it multiple times. Frostbite was not uncommon. One guy joked that you could tell a real oil field hand by the fact he was missing the fleshy part toward the tip of his nose. There was always a lot of talk about real oil field hands. Pride was one thing no one can take from you out there. Boom towns find ways to take your money. You made a lot of money though, right? Is usually the question I could ask right about now. I hate to admit it, but I didn't. I was paid $21.25 an hour. I got a lot of overtime, but frankly, I find the economist's habit of conflating an average of 70 hours a week of heavy manual labor to 40 hours a week of office work to be, if not purposely designed to minimize the sacrifices of working people, then at the very least wildly ignorant. Boomtowns by design find ways to take your money as fast as you make it. When large amounts of cash flood a small town in an incredibly short period of time, a kind of localized hyperinflation occurs. The most precious commodity in Williston outside oil was housing. In 13, rents in Northwest Dakota surpassed those of San Francisco to become the most expensive in the nation. When I first arrived, I paid $450 for a mattress on the floor of a living room, which I shared with four other migrant men in a small townhouse packed with as many as 12 people. This was the best deal in town. Inflated prices affected every aspect of life. Lunch at a truck stop could cost me $30. Shops and restaurants had trouble staying staffed. Famously, workers at Williston's Walmart gave up on stocking the shelves. A local diner took to stacking applications by the register with a sign saying, Complaints? Take one. When my truck broke down, it took me two months to get a mechanic to look at it. There was a shortage of hospital workers, teachers, and cops. A thriving black market developed. Sex workers set up at motels advertising hourly rates on Craigslist. Sex trafficking became a big, big problem in a small town.
America's current crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women has been tied to the prevalence of man camps, a common feature of modern boom towns. Crime in general escalated. Police officers reported increases in alcohol-related and drug-related crimes, property and traffic crime, domestic violence, and prostitution. Some statistics appear to support the idea that the crime increase was unremarkable as it simply mirrored the population increase, but this misses the point. The Williston Police Department had 22 officers on staff in 2007 and got 4,579 calls for service. By 2010, calls increased to 16,495 and they'd only hired two more officers. There weren't enough cops. Officers reported an inability to offer community policing and an increase in reactive policing. The small town force adopted a more militarized style of policing. In many ways, every boom town was alike. Had a teamster from 1860s era pit hole stepped through a time warp and found himself in his mule chopping down Route 2 in Williston in the late 2000s, he would no doubt have recognized what he saw. Pit hole in western Pennsylvania in an area known as the Oil Dorado was America's first true oil boomtown. Accounts from the period tell the story of Coal Oil Johnny, a dim-winded young man made rich by oil overnight. Johnny hosted parties that outstripped even the Roman orgies. When he saw a play he liked, he bought the theater troupe. Tired by the rigors of travel, like a modern-day one-percenter would Learjet, Johnny bought a train. Ben Hogan, a former prize fighter and murderer, operated Pithole's biggest brothel with his mistress, French Kate, and a revolving door of soiled doves. Sex workers known by names of Dolly the Swede and Champagne Mommy and Lizzie Toppling. Time has a way of neutering the darker details of history and making the terror sound quaint and fun, but don't let the cute names fool you. John Wilkes Booth was an early investor in oil before he murdered a president. He could be found in Pithole's taverns declaiming soliloquies from Richard III. By the end of the Civil War, Oil Dorado was flooded by veterans of both the Blue and Gray. The Union General M. H. Avery Road, directly from Lee's surrender at Appomattox to Pithole, where he put his cavalry skills to use by organizing a train of Teamsters. Since Pithole, oil has completely transformed human existence. From transportation to textiles to pharmaceuticals to farming, petroleum has become the basic building block for every facet of modern life. Boomtowns have fired that transformation. Like wrenches and drill bits, these towns are best thought of as instruments meant to assure the utmost efficiency in removing valuables from the earth while gaining the most possible profit. They are not a bug in Big Oil's business model. They are not a flaw. They are a feature. Boomtowns bust when the resource dries up or becomes too expensive to extract and the work leaves town. Williston went the way of every other of America's legendary boom towns. The majority of wealth generated was funneled out of the local community with migrant workers sending money home. The low cost of oil primarily benefiting wealthier urban and suburban areas and profits spiraling upward into the pockets of the world's richest. Williston natives had seen it all before. Before the 2000s. <coughs> Williston boomed in the 1970s. One friend of mine, a Williston native, joked that between the booms, he'd look for jobs by going through the obituaries. Another hand told me that during that same period, he had taken to poaching, illegally hunting to put food on the table for his family. Oil companies have used this business model for 150 years. I left Williston in 2014, my belongings loaded up into my Ford Ranger pickup. I was heading back east to return to what I hoped would be a simpler, less dangerous life. My move was well-timed, despite the optimistic projections that the state would add over 13,000 jobs in 2014 and nearly 30,000 by 2020. The number of active drilling wells in North Dakota dropped from a high of 195 to a low of 64, when the price of oil plummeted from 107.95 a barrel in June of 2014 to 44.08 a barrel seven months later. Companies laid off workers, migrants fled and support for businesses shattered and shuttered. North Dakota went bust. Had I decided to stay, I would have been out of a job within a year regardless.
It's impossible to say how many individuals found financial success during Williston's boom. I know I didn't. I left town with less cash than I'd arrived with. Admitting that makes me feel dumb, but I'm hardly the only one. Most people I met during the boom could be described as poor or lower middle class. Most of us bought nicer stuff during those years. Many of us did. And some of us I know used the money they made to transition into more stable work. That said, it would be hard for me to name a person who somehow changed their station in life, who used the boom to grab a higher rung on the ladder in the American dream. I am absolutely certain, however, as it is apparently impossible for them not to in our current economic system, that the rich got richer. The Cost of Oil Extraction <coughs> The Broken Down Bodies The broken down bodies of generations of oil workers are one testament to the world of oil extraction. So are blazing forests and soupy glaciers. The history of Pit Hole, written by a wounded Civil War veteran turned newspaper reporter called Crocus, devotes an entire chapter to the multitude of fires that raised the town. The month of April 1866, he writes, was noted for its many disastrous conflagrations. 2 April Oil refinery of battles, Vorse and Co. burned, two wells upon the Rooker farm, 3 April. Fire on Holmdom Street, Utica House, grocery establishment, shoe shop burned, lost 5K. 9 April. Old Holmden House and bathrooms of J. Sheave destroyed, lost 5K. 10 April. Tanks of Titusville Pipe Company burned with large amount of other property, including engines, derricks, and so, lost 20K. 14 April. Refinery of Van Horn and Co. on lease. 110 Thomas Holden Farm, Wells 107 and 108 Holmden, and 13 and 14 Rooker Farm, destroyed by fire. Loss, 16K and or 160,000. Next loss, 30,000. Total loss, 135,000. The remorseless list, notable for its lack of humanity and relentless financial accounting, continues like a litany. The Biden administration is currently attempting to stop the fires that started in Pit Hole making the boldest push to move away from fossil fuels and confront the climate crisis in the history of the nation. That's not very bold. <coughs> if sustainable green technology is the future, then it needs to provide sustainable, good-paying jobs, something that, frankly, the oil companies have advertised much more than they ever bothered to deliver. Oil is never going away completely. Therefore, oil field workers should be more highly compensated. The industry should be forced to put real money into extractive communities instead of treating them as tools that they toss out as soon as they're done with them. Not everything needs to be a crash cash grab. Not all the money needs to go to the top. As a nation, we should take better care of our extractive communities. People in towns like Williston, North Dakota, have been on the front lines of energy extraction for longer than a century. The developing green energy industry should be incentivized to put new sustainable jobs in extractive communities, much like our soldiers coming home from overseas. The workers and families in these towns deserve our gratitude, our respect, and our investment. This essay is adapted from his 19th of May testimony before the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee of the Natural Resources Committee of the United States. Michael Patrick F. Smith is a former oil field hand and the author of The Good Hand, a memoir of work, brotherhood, and transformation in an American boom town. To stick with uh, Midwest news, we're going to talk a little bit about how difficult it is for people in Des Moines to get uh, clean water, and um, I I think that it, this is due to the amount of nitrates that come from their uh, pork industry, their swine pig industry. Uh, I remember when I was in Des Moines for Bernie Sanders, they pay more money than any other city in the country. 
for water processing quote or check me on that I, I think that's true some of the most comprehensive water studies in Polk County Des Moines County are concluding in the coming months a five-year assessment of the program's ongoing studies published last year found that most sites fell below pollution threshold threshold but some exceeded chloride and phosphate levels I know I've got another story around this somewhere. Here. Des Moines faces extreme measures to find clean water. For years, Des Moines Water Works has tried to force or control farmers upstream to reduce the runoff of fertilizer that leaves the rivers with sky-high nitrate levels, but lawsuits and legislative lobbying have failed. In the dim light just after dawn, Bill Bluebaugh parks his Des Moines Waterworks pickup truck, grabs a dipper and a couple plastic bottles, and walks down a boat ramp to the Raccoon River, where he scoops up samples from a waterway that cuts through some of the nation's most intensely farmed lands. Each day the utility analyzes what's in the samples and others from nearby Des Moines River as it works to deliver drinking water to 500,000 people in the capital city and suburbs. Some mornings it smells like ammonia. It's concerning. I'm down here every morning and care about the water. <coughs> it's now considering a drastic measure that as a rule, large cities just do not do. Drilling wells to find clean water. Small communities and individuals use wells, but large U.S. metro areas have always relied primarily on rivers and lakes for the large volumes of water needed. Surface sources provide about 70% of fresh water in the United States, as a reliance on wells for big populations would quickly deplete the aquifers. The utility in Des Moines is planning to spend $30 million to drill wells to mix in pure water when the rivers have especially high nitrate levels from farm runoff, most likely in the summer. After spending $18 million over the last two decades on a system to treat the tainted river water, it's frustrating to pay out millions more for something other cities wouldn't imagine. Des Moines has become an extreme example of the conflict over clean water between agriculture and cities and farm states with minimal regulation. Iowa is a national leader in producing corn, soybeans, eggs, and pork, and all that agricultural bounty resorts in enormous amounts of chemical fertilizer and animal waste pouring into the waterways. The state's 23 million pigs produce waste that would be equivalent to 83 million people, more than 25 times the state's human population, according to University of Research, Iowa researcher Chris Jones. Most of that manure is spread over Iowa's 26 million acres of cropland, along with chemical fertilizers. The natural and chemical fertilizers have helped Iowa increase its corn and soybean production by roughly 50% over the past 30 years but much of it ends up in Iowa's waterways, especially in areas of north-central Iowa that drain into Des Moines and the Raccoon Rivers. It's because the area's farmland is relatively flat and relies on drainage systems called tiles that don't allow excess fertilizer to filter through the soil, but instead quickly pour it into streams, leading to high levels of nitrate and phosphorus. Although there is plenty of agreement on ways to filter out chemicals, such as by leaving buffer zones and planting cover crops like rye when the ground would otherwise be bare, the state's farm lobby has opposed mandatory rules, and Iowa legislators have favored a voluntary approach that hasn't made a dent in the problem. Waterworks and other groups have filed lawsuits demanding more rigorous action, but judges have decided to leave the issue to the legislature. Lately, utility officials have become concerned by increase in algal blooms caused by a combination of fertilizer runoff, high temperatures, and slow-moving water. Rivers tainted by the algae can't be used as drinking water. Nitrates can cause so-called blue baby syndrome in which infants lose the ability to properly process oxygen in the bloodstream, giving their skin a bluish tint. The question was, what's next with these challenging surface waters we're dealing with? Are we just going to have a rolling series of multi-million dollar processes to make our treatment process more complex and more expensive? 
Waterworks is now paying the United States Geological Service $770,000 to evaluate spots to drill wells just north of the city. VP of Minneapolis, warning to you too. Vice President of Minneapolis-based Bar Engineering Company Brian Lamont said he didn't know of another large city with such high levels of nitrate. The much larger Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area to the north has no similar problem with the water it takes from the Mississippi River in part because of less intensive farming and animal production upriver, required buffer strips, and the river's larger volume. Nitrate removal is not cheap, said Lamont, whose company is a consultant for Des Moines Waterworks planning process. Mike Naig, Iowa's Secretary of Agriculture, acknowledges the runoff problem but supports the state's voluntary Iowa nutrient reduction strategy which uses limited state and federal funding to pay for water quality projects on farmland. Workers are now installing buffers and implementing other efforts in Polk County, where Des Moines is located, but even advocates, ac advocates acknowledge that making a significant difference would require filtering runoff of thousands of locations, potentially costing billions. Hello, uh, Tiger Gurr, don't recognize your name, and Barnsdale, nice to see you both. I am just kind of focused on, you know, sharing information and so forth, so if I'm not engaging in oh, enough, I, I am reading your comments. Dave Walton, who grows soybeans and corn in eastern Iowa, said farmers should do their part to reduce nitrates, but that each farm is different and regulations wouldn't be uniformly effective. He said preventing runoff is costly and re would require public-private partnerships that likely would take decades. If a farm operation is going to be sustainable, they have to create profit year after year after year. To ask a farmer to invest in something that doesn't add to the bottom line in a period of time when they're not making profit anyway, it's just a moot point. And that's really a hard thing. I'm, uh, I'm on the road, I'm talking to farmers right now, and none of them are really making any money. They just, and if they are making money, they're working 80, 90, 100 hours a week, and they're making a little bit of money, but they're not getting health care. So is that even making money? Kind of the same thing for that Boom Bust Town article. Timothy LaPara, an engineering professor at the University of Minnesota, said nearly every city faces some complication in ensuring safe drinking water, but the Des Moines problem requires an unusual solution. Nitrate doesn't usually get to these levels. Central Iowa has some of the worst water quality you'll find. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to the news team. We do have around 50 or 60 stories to somewhat get to. Some of them are related, some of them are unrelated. We'll, uh, we'll kind of see how much we can get through here in one day. Oh, did I just close one that I didn't want to? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, whoops. Uh, what was that one actually, ca oh, what was that one called? Damn. I think, um, Yeah, this is it. Okay. This is an article from the Farm Journal Ag Web. While America slept, China stole the farm. Uh, what's CRP land?
Hmm. I don't exactly know how I completely feel about this one about China taking intellectual property. Um, get better at protecting good American companies. This is what you're for, right? Aren't you supposed to protect your profits at all costs? Um, I don't really, I don't really get upset at when um, IP is taken because I don't think that IP should be as long as it is as is now. Um, we can read through this one if you would all like to. Uh, it's going to be very heavily anti-China. So I can leave it up to some of you all if you want to read through this one. I, I think the TLDR is uh, mostly a boo-hoo. China took our intellectual property. So if anybody wants to read that one, we can, but for now, I'm not going to. Oh yeah, that is kind of strange to do, Alka. To combat climate change, researchers want to pull carbon dioxide from the ocean and turn it into rock. Oh, I think I, yeah, I know that this is with olivine. We've talked about olivine before. Okay, where are we here? The team built a 1.5 by 1.5 meter prototype that they can flood with simulated seawater. They're collecting data on the amount of carbon dioxide that can be removed over various periods of time. The process is a bit like a water treatment plant, but instead of taking in water and sifting out impurities, the proposed plant would use electricity to force carbon, calcium, and magnesium to react and become solids. The purified water would then be returned to the ocean. Hmm, I haven't heard of doing it this way. You're returning water that's slightly more alkaline than what you put in. This more alkaline water could help mitigate the effects of ocean acidification in the immediate vicinity. As well as pulling carbon out of seawater, the chemical reaction has a useful byproduct, hydrogen gas. By producing and selling the hydrogen, the plant could offset its costs. Even if the proposed ocean carbon capture plant is powered by nat gas instead of renewables, the whole process could still be carbon, carbon negative because of the hydrogen gas byproduct. Hmm. Planetary hydrogen is extracting carbon from seawater trapping it in a solid and indirectly making hydrogen gas. Rather than using electrolysis, they're doing it with hydroxide. It's an alkaline material that speeds up an otherwise natural process. Rocks reacting with carbon dioxide and water to form alkaline forms of carbon, which would typically take place over geological timescales. Hmm. Carbon dioxide is much less concentrated in the atmosphere than in the ocean. So direct air capture efforts typically need to be quite large to have a significant impact. Oh, okay, so here's an issue. There are drawbacks to the proposal that could make it difficult for the technology to progress. The biggest seems to be the amount of solids the process would create once it's operating at a scale meaningful enough to affect climate change. Removing 10 gigatons of CO2 from the ocean would yield 20 gigatons of carbonates. For the better half of a decade, Sant's research has focused on streamlining the process of combining mm -hmm. carbon... Sorry. Hmm. 
with calcium hydroxide to form concrete. Because my carbon dioxide sequestration method effectively produces carbon neutral limestone, now you've got the ability to produce carbon neutral cement and use the limestone solids for construction. Hmm. Okay, that sounds actually okay. I need to uh, be right back. I just got to run around to the bathroom. I'm so sorry, everybody. I'll be fast. So I'm kind of a little bit interested in this so far. A lot of the solids produced by ocean capture could be used that way, but there will still be tons left that would have to go back into the ocean, which could upset local marine ecosystems. He said it's worth comparing the proposed plant's potential impacts to the effects of a desalination plant. Hello, Kevin. I need to raid you sometime, I think. I don't even know if I follow your channel. Sorry about that. Hello. Yeah, um, the channel is going to continue to be about um, energy generation, agricultural generation, uh, currency, trade, geopolitical tensions, political economy, macroeconomics, and the intersections of these, uh, you know, these different realms. Uh, also, uh, some people reached out to me and they want to help me make a YouTube video uh, detailing 25 ecological calamities and potential solutions to said ecological calamities. So I got into a pretty good conversation the other night uh, just about climate change and ecological collapse in general and uh, some people want to help me get together and put something nice into a video. I have not seen the trailer. Hmm. This is an interesting one. So there are ways to do actual carbon sequestration. Um, they're building direct uh, air capture devices on top of some trains potentially, and then they're going to be using the kinetic electric uh, recovery system heat from acceleration and deceleration to power a couple of cars that's then able to uh, turn the CO2 into a usable material uh, or so forth. So 
this is all going to be being put together for that YouTube video. Ah, uh, yes. I don't know if people heard about this one at all. We are going to be uh, shifting topics here a little bit. And also, uh, today, everybody, if you want to hit exclamation mark socials, and if you want to follow me on Twitter, at the end of all of this, I'm going to click this tab up here, uh, one tab, and then I'm going to give you all, all of these tabs if you want to read them. So all I have to do is click that button, and it gives me a little code, and then you can get access to all of these uh, stories. This one I can mostly do the TLDR of. A record buyout is just the start as wealthy flee a tax hike. So uh, since rich people think that capital gains tax is going to be increased and taxes are going up as they are, uh, any kind of like family businesses are being sold uh, through leveraged buyouts into either private equity firms or SPACs or so forth. Uh, and it, it, it seems to be continuing uh, in this direction. So according to people close to the more than $30 billion transaction, Medline Industries was sold to a consortium of Wall Street investors in the healthcare industry's biggest leverage buyout. The threat of subject subjecting billions in proceeds to additional capital gains taxes motivated the Klan to get the deal done before the end of 2021. The vast deal-making machinery that caters to wealthy entrepreneurs has started buzzing with a level of activity that some industry veterans say they have not seen before. Here's another one. Executives at the top of boutique mergers and acquisitions firm founders advisors are settling into a freshly expanded office space and completing a hasty hiring spree to increase staffing by 50%. They're signing up millionaire owners of companies eager to start the process of selling part of what they've built. They've got more engagements than they've ever had. Well, it can be it can be turned into fuel. It can be turned into stones and buried under the earth. Uh, it can be processed and refined. It can be there. There are there are things to be done with it. So yeah, this is basically the story, uh, really just that um, rich people are looking to sell anything that they can at the moment. It being carbon dioxide, yeah. Um, I think that, I think it can somewhat be feasible. What would the issue of storing it in the ground be? Mm, I'm trying to wonder, could we just like, could we pour it back into the abandoned fracking wells? Could we use the existing, uh, can you use, can you reverse engineer fracking machinery to once used for extraction, p dump down into uh, fill those places? I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud. Hello, good afternoon Raiders. Uh, thank you very much for the Raid Bleep Blomp Ben. So we began our day out with uh, uh, this story. Uh, I joined the oil rush to an American boom town. Guess who got rich? It was a really wonderful story. So if anybody wants the uh, full list of tabs that we have up across here today, uh, all that you're going to have to do is follow me on Twitter. And I'm going to click, uh, well, actually, I can do it right now. So basically, here, if all of you want this, how about I just give it to you right now? If you want to avoid my stream and save yourself a ton of time, these are the stories that we're going to be reading through the day. Uh, it's talking about uh, pulling carbon dioxide from the ocean and turning it into rock. We talked about uh, permaculture a little bit, the oil rush boom bust town. Uh, we talked about Des Moines uh, water quality and nitrate runoff uh, from the pig farming that's taking place. Uh, we talked about a huge uh, bump in leverage buyouts and mergers and acquisitions as rich families are trying to get ahead of what they assume would be Joe Biden uh, tax uh, raises. Um, and then we're going to be talking about uh, evolving a fungus uh, very quickly to battle varroa bee mites. 
we're talking American infrastructure. We're going to talk Julian Assange and what are the charges against him? What aren't the charges against him? Uh, Jeff Bezos had a really strange comment that work-life balance is a debilitating phase. Um, did you, you didn't offend me. Oh, no, 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 you didn't offend me at all. No, I just, I'm trying to, when I stream, I want it to be a very good use of people's time or I don't want to have the camera turned on. Uh, so, no, this is me just not wanting to waste people's time. Uh, thank you very much, Bleep Blunt Ben, for the raid. If anybody's looking for a very, um, I didn't want to say routine, very by the calendar, is that the word that I'm looking for? Ben always streams at the same time. So if you want to get good news in the morning, uh, go go check out Bleep Blunt Ben. If you like uh, deep dive type things and news from time to time, I'm Brad. I'm currently on a road trip across the country. I'm investigating the big sand industry and trying to do a little bit of a... Um, a story about how the world is going through a silica shortage. I've also been touring different farms, different farmers markets, uh, learning about no-till agriculture, permaculture, high tunnel, tomato farming, hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, and so forth. And these are some of the other things that we're going to be chatting about today. So thank you all for the raid. Yes, I did say big sand. Yes, I did say big sand. Uh, <laughs> blew my mind too. Uh, be sure to leave a follow button, everybody, if you think some of this kind of stuff is interesting. And now I need to hit this thing, restore all, go back to where we were. Which was... Okay, well, we finished the tax story, so we can go with this one. Anybody have any questions for me before we keep going here? Oh, wh why did I uh, lose my window? Okay, to make uh, agriculture more climate friendly, carbon farming needs clear rules. Uh, so there are talks out there about are we going to have carbon credits? Are we going to pay farmers for carbon sequestration? Uh, if we want to pay farmers for carbon sequestration, how can it be utilized? Some ways that are how can it be monitored and uh, tracked and, and so forth? Some ways that I've heard is um, you can use <coughs> you can determine the amount of like oh gosh someone's going to have to help me here because I'm going to get my technology wrong. Somehow you can test the transmissibility of water through different surfaces to determine like a chemical composition or makeup or something. Okay, that one feels completely wrong. Or somehow you can use LIDAR to determine maybe soil composition or something, but that sounds a little bit incorrect also. Uh, but kind of the, the difficulty at the moment of paying farmers to sequester carbon is it appears quite difficult to determine how to sequester it. Now there is a hemp hemp carbon sequestration blockchain Utah maybe? Yeah, so this I don't exactly understand. A Utah company is using blockchain to measure CO2 emissions for hemp farms. Um, the solution will take data from critical points throughout the cultivation process, registering, registering both CO2 sequestration and emissions into a blockchain record. But how are they measuring? Okay, so I guess they've already taken an average here so far. Industrial hemp absorbs 8 to 15 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare of cultivation, while forests typically capture 2 to 6 tons per hectare, depending on climate region and growth stage. So I guess the whole kind of thinking would be, can you sequester more carbon dioxide via hemp farming than carbon dioxide that you would have to put into cultivating, growing, and harvesting it. Uh, no, uh, I disagree with this. L. Ron Hubbard. 
farmers are not the biggest bunch of crooks on the face of the earth. Um, I've spoken to a lot of farmers. Maybe big agriculture? Okay, maybe, sure. But the farmers that I've spoken to are the most wonderful, some of the most wonderful people that I've spoken with. So I don't agree with the first part of this. I'm not disagreeing that it shouldn't be a free enterprise per se, but this is uh no, I, I don't have that I don't have that position and I've spoken with about forty farmers over the past thirty days, maybe twenty days. Well, no, but the but the good part about so okay, just because something is blockchain, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be proof of work and it doesn't mean that it's gonna be energy intensive. Blockchain can simply just be an immutable ledger. So you can actually you can you can run a blockchain without it using eighty seven bajillion kilowatts of electricity. The the simple concept of utilizing a blockchain would just be it's an immutable, unalterable digital ledger that can be utilized across multiple different uh realms. Um so now well okay, but milk but milk is uh Okay, milk is like a regulatory captured industry, and you're driving milk tankers. That's not really dealing with, like, the farmers. So, like, that's where I would say there could be a little bit of difference. Like, tanking the milk, it's usually, like, a cartel that, like, purchases it at an X price or whatever. But I'm talking about, like, the actual farmers that are doing, like, the actual work and so forth. It's a little bit different than the attached industry that just extracts all the profit from the farmers and from us. Thank you. I do uh, I do try to be fair. Well, I mean, you've been around here for a long time. You know that I at least come from a good place, even if incorrect. Oh, you were, okay, here you go. You said Nori from before. Um, so there, uh, damn, I figured that was going to happen. Okay, so we're going to go into that article next. So we've got Indigo, Ag, and Nor. Oh, damn it. Um, no, my community is, though. Um, I'm very lucky to have a channel where people just want to come and learn about, like, complex topics. And they're okay with me only being like a 200 level instead of a galaxy brain. But then as our powers unite, uh, then we become a galaxy brain community. So when viewers are here, I expect them to work. I expect, uh, <laughs> I expect people to you know, link in articles from time to time and uh, push back where it is required and agree when required. So no, we're maybe galaxy brain, but I not. Okay, so yeah, here, here's the issue. There's no universal standards for measuring, reporting, or verifying agricultural carbon credits. Here are the questions we see as top priorities. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't like, um, I don't really like going into the having carbon credits because it's just going to be purchased by Coca-Cola, by PepsiCo, by all these, by all these different places. One major challenge is that soils absorb varying amounts of carbon depending on depth, texture, and mineral content. Certain practices can increase carbon storage. Quantifying how much of it is stored is critical for assigning dollar values to them. The markets and prices that work in different locations also widely vary. Some scientific models offer estimates of carbon sequestration for vari climate, various climate and soil types based on averages over large areas but they would need rigorous models verified by measurements to avoid crediting carbon that never ends up in soil or doesn't remain there for long. Verification isn't easy as of yet. Okay, here was one of them. Infrared spectroscopy. That's what I was trying to find. Identifies materials in soil by analyzing how they absorb or refract IR light. Or I guess you can do machine learning, but I don't know how that one would work. Although studies in the United States, Great Plains, the United Kingdom, and the European Union suggests these are promising low-cost methods. Okay, so 
producers need incentives to implement climate change smart practices. And I, I really just want to like re-hit on this point. Uh, Elron, this isn't directly like y y said to you, but I, I really want to continue illustrating how my conversations with farmers. I'm currently on a 30-day road trip so far. I've been in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Washington, D.C., West Virginia, um, Kentucky, Indiana. I've gone to like four different farmers markets. I've spoken with 30 or 40 different farmers. I talked with farmers up to 4,000 acres of wheat, down to 230 acres of wheat, up to 700 acres of wheat, down to two high tunnel tomato farmers, to saltwater shrimp farmers, to no-till backyard urban market gardeners, to living walkway market gardeners, to traditional vegetable farmers, to melon farmers, and so forth. I mean, I, I give all this background to say, like, I'm act it's not just anecdotal evidence. You know, I've gone out, I've interviewed people, I've spoken to them about the state of farming. <coughs> a majority of them are barely making ends meet. And the only reason that they're still in the industry is because the land was in their family for a very long time. They feel a connection to that kind of work because their family has done the work forever, and they don't really know what else to do. So I, I do just want to continue to hit on not only... In the farmers in the United States, but I would have to imagine the world, are r barely scraping by. So you're just saying they're just going to use a satellite global information system? Okay, the Nori removal, carbon removal marketplace. So what you can you can pay farmers to plant a specific type of thing to mitigate your uh <coughs> to mitigate your carbon footprint through Nori. I'll have to take a look through this one. But see, this is where I don't like it because Boston Consulting Group, Shopify, Barclays, JP Morgan, GiveWith, IBM, Dogfish Head are buying these carbon credits. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that big corporations are just going to be able to greenwash themselves and say, "Oh, look, see, we buy all these credits. We're fine." I, I don't like that. This looks to be a good paper, though. No-till systems have a 66% lower global warming potential and 71% lower greenhouse gas intensity than conventionally tilled systems per unit of yield. So that already goes to show you right there why no-till is so much better. Then you can get into permaculture, then you can get into regenerative ag, then you can get into vertical farming, uh, horizontal hydroponics, aquaponics. So that'll be another one to keep. <coughs> yeah. I have a lot of papers to read, holy hell. Using diffuse reflectance spectroscopy as a high throughput method for quantifying soil, carbon, and nitrogen. Hmm. So I guess this is going to be one of the big ways that they do it. I just, these are beyond my level of comprehension.
Okay, moving a little bit out of carbon sequestration into a new topic, and I mean, we may be coming back to it or so forth. Uh, so, I wonder how much of this we're going to get through today. Well, yeah, you, I mean, you have to do pathways. Um, a lot of people do wood chip pathways in between their beds. Or uh, straw. You can, you can... Uh, put straw down over top of everything but is that really no till then if you're having to bring in like straw from offsite uh, it all gets complicated all good america's trillion dollar concrete bill is coming due concrete construction no longer lasts thousands of years instead the lifespan is about 50 to 100 years thanks to the way in which modern concrete is reinforced uh you can look up um no till growers on youtube or Josh Satin or Clydeson on Twitch or me. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome to the news team. One of the most famous concrete buildings in America, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, cost 155000 to build in 1936, the equivalent to $2 million in 2001. The cost of repairs in 2001 came to $11.5 million. Once rebar starts corroding, the standard fix involves jackhammering the concrete to expose the steel, brushing the steel to remove the rust, reinforcing the rebar, and then covering it back up again with carefully color-matched new concrete. Oh my god. Oh, God. Oh, that sounds like absolute fucking hell. <laughs> oh, my God. Remember, everybody, we were talking about big sand before. The average home takes 200 tons of sand in order to have enough concrete for the home. So now multiply this across redeveloping all these buildings, and you understand why there's a massive illicit market and illegal trade for silica uh, yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Because concrete fails from the inside out, damage can be hard to detect, and because concrete looks so solid and impregnable, necessary maintenance is often skipped, causing massive bills later on. Local governments are in charge of ensuring building safety, but their willingness and ability to do so varies widely. The owners and residents of concrete buildings often try very hard not to think about corrosion, just because the costs of fixing it are so enormous. The amount of money needed to fix existing infrastructure, nearly all of which is concrete, stands at roughly $6 trillion, <laughs> according to the American Society of Civil Engineers. That number does not include homes, offices, and other private buildings. <laughs> Wow. Wow. I don't know uh, hempcrete duration because I don't, mm, I mean, I guess there are some ways that they could, uh, I guess there's some ways they could test, but I don't know that answer at all, actually.
That is just not good. Six trillion dollars. <laughs> That's just. <sighs> okay, uh, from The Guardian. The scientists hired by Big Oil who predicted the climate crisis long ago. Experts' discoveries lie at the heart of two dozen lawsuits that hope to hold the industry accountable for devastating damage. Written by Emma Pate. As early as 1958, the oil industry was hiring scientists and engineers to research the role that burning fossil fuels plays in global warming. The goal at the time was to help major oil conglomerates understand how changes in the Earth's atmosphere may affect the industry and their bottom line. But what they gained was an early preview of the climate crisis, decades before it reached the public consensus. What those scientists discovered is at the heart of two dozen lawsuits attempting to hold the fossil fuel industry responsible for their role. Many cases hinge on the industry's own internal documents that show how 40 years ago, these are the documents from 1977 to 1982 uh, that are published in Inside Climate News' paper, where ExxonMobil brought researchers from Bell Labs in order to uh, fix uh, carbon dioxide monitoring systems at the bottom of their transport vessels that uh, carried oil across the Pacific Ocean in addition to internal uh, research uh, that they had conducted. A majority of their internal research predicted approximately 420 parts per million CO2 accumulation by the year 2020. Or 420 by 2020. Uh, we're right around like 416 by 2020. When I started consulting for Exxon, Marty Hoffert had already begun to understand the Earth's climate would be affected by carbon dioxide. There were only a small number of people in the world who were actively working on the problem because global warming signal had not manifested itself in the data. So I was invited to join a research group at Exxon, and one of the conditions to join was that we would publish our scientific research in peer-reviewed journals. We were doing very good work at Exxon. We had eight scientific papers published in peer-reviewed journals, including a prediction how much global warming from carbon dioxide buildup would be 40 years later. We made a prediction in 1980 of what atmospheric warming would be from fossil fuel burning in 2020. We predicted it would be about one degree, and it is about one degree Celsius. It never occurred to me that this was going to become a political problem. I thought, we'll do the analyses, we'll write reports, the politicians of the world will see the reports, and they'll make appropriate changes and transform our energy system. I'm a research scientist. In my field, if you discover something and it turns out to be valid, you're a hero. I didn't realize how hard it would be to convince people, even when they saw objective evidence of this happening. Back in 1980, there was a guy working for Exxon. <coughs> he was one of the inventors of the lithium battery. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on lithium batteries. Just imagine if Exxon management had taken our prediction seriously. They could have easily built huge factories to make lithium batteries to facilitate the transition to electric cars. Instead, they fired this guy. They shut down all their energy work, and they started funding climate deniers. Very often, people will ask me, how much time do we have left before we can prevent the problem? We don't have any time left. It's already happening. Since the start of 2016, more than 700 suits have been filed in the United States. Many of these cases target the government, some for weakening environmental laws, others for enforcing regulations that plaintiffs argue are unconstitutional. Now there's 26 cases that are unique. They're beginning to sue oil and gas companies for their role in the crisis. Most of them argue that oil and gas companies caused a public nuisance, that the fossil fuel industry made areas less livable for people, often forcing the government to use public funds to fix the problems.
Cattle are competing against grasshoppers for food in the West's historic drought, and the bugs are winning. A bizarre impact of the pernicious dry condition is the explosion of the grasshopper population. Grasshoppers have devoured so much vegetation that many ranchers fear rangelands could be stripped bare. A 2021 grasshopper hazard map shows each square yard of land contains at least 15 grasshoppers in parts of Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Arizona, Colorado, and Nebraska. They thrive in hot, dry weather, have been defoliating trees and competing with cattle for food, and the bugs are winning. Oh, God. And then look at what their solution is, not one that I would want to do. To mitigate further drought-fueled economic impacts, the agency has launched a grasshopper killing campaign, the largest since the last outbreak in Montana in the 1980s. They plan to aerially spray more than 2.6 million acres of Montana grasslands with insecticides in an attempt to kill grasshopper populations. That's an area larger than both the state of Delaware and Rhode Island combined. I'm going to pull my hair out today. If it hasn't already fallen out. Uh, there's a multitude of different reasons why we don't eat them. One, they are um, going to be first shifted onto the poor populations uh, as a way of like, why don't you plebes, you know, do your part or so forth. Uh, secondly, you can't exactly just go out there and capture them. Uh, you can farm grasshoppers. Okay, fine. That I'll concede, but you can't really just... Um, there's not really a way to just grab them. Uh, from out in the wild. Yep. 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 The problem... The problem with insecticide treatments is that it could actually worsen grasshopper outbreaks in the future by harming the natural enemies or grasshopper competitors, which serve to limit pest grasshoppers. However, this bunk paper, I wonder who, I wonder who funded this. Okay, so alternative one was no action. <coughs> so they are going to do insecticides at USDA APHIS conventional rates or rats to suppress grasshopper outbreaks, including adaptive management. Yeah, I don't agree with this at all. The USDA says we'll only spray in low concentrations to kill grasshopper, grasshopper nymphs, since adult grasshoppers require larger amounts of insecticides. <coughs> hmm. The population of grassland bird species are declining, therefore they're not eating as many grasshoppers. Vegetation cover has also been decreasing in part due to how grazing is conducted. We need to embrace a management approach that emulates the natural disturbance regime. It's considered a better way to make forest and fire resilient. We need a similar approach for grass water management on rainlands. A recent climate assessment of the greater Yellowstone area which is part of the region with dense grasshopper populations, has warned of significant changes such as invasive species outbreaks in the region as the planet warms. How much land are they spraying again? 2.46 million acres, the size of Rhode Island and Delaware combined.
if anybody likes this work at all and you want to support my channel, whoops, that's not how you do it. I am um, very proud of what our channel and our community has become. I think that I'm actually finally developing into a reporter or a journalist. Uh, we cover macroecon, climate change, uh, agricultural production, ecological collapse, uh, currencies, trade, and uh, the intersections of these things. So if you like this kind of stuff and it doesn't completely doom you out, uh, or if it does completely doom you out and you just want to tip and bounce, you can do that too. Uh, but I appreciate it as always. Whoops. Okay, next we have uh, something about Madagascar, and then we're moving out of climate issues for a brief moment before, you know, shocker, diving back in. We've got uh, Mexico water supply, but then, yeah, we have some finance stuff coming up here pretty soon. So one more climate piece, and then we're going into some finance news. Madagascar is headed toward a climate change-linked famine it did not create, by Adam Taylor. <coughs> Hunger has already left people eating raw red cactus fruits, wild leaves, and even the very locusts that help decimate crops. Thank you, Alka. Uh, yeah, it's good to be back when I can seek or spread it forward. The southern part of the country is experiencing its worst drought in decades, with the World Food Program warning that 1.14 million people are food insecure and 400,000 people are headed towards starvation. The country south is suffering from its worst drought conditions recorded since 1981, as well as other problems such as cyclones, dust storms, and even locusts. Weather patterns have been shifting. A lack of consistent rainfall has been the worst effect, with five of the last six rainy seasons in the country bringing below average rainfall, led to failed harvests and underfed livestock, with farmers forced to sell off what they had to buy food to provide for their families. Increasing dust storms known as Tiomena, locust swarms, once a rare occurrence, are now regularly devastating crops. pandemic is still raging in Africa and the Delta variant is on the rise. Lingering conflict in Tigray threatens to spill into a broader battle involving not just Ethiopia but Eritrea as well, while refugees have poured into Sudan. Crises caused by climate change beget other crises. Struggle with conflict and ethnic divisions in the past and children are being pulled out of education as food becomes scarce. Food prices are rising around the world, according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, thanks in large part to a combination of trade pressure, COVID-19, and climate problems. Yeah, <laughs> you are completely right. I think they're just purely negative. in a very rich comment and <laughs> kind of a story that I've been looking forward to reading through so I can laugh. Bezos says, work-life balance is a debilitating phrase. He wants Amazon workers to view their career and lives as a circle. <coughs> it's actually a circle, it's not a balance. Bezos said his new hire should stop trying to find balance. 
since that implied a strict trade-off between the two. Instead, Bezos envisions a more holistic relationship between work and life outside the office. The work-life harmony thing is what I try to teach young employees and actually senior executives at Amazon too. But especially the people coming in, I get asked about work-life balance all the time. In my view, is that's a debilitating phrase because it implies there's a strict trade-off. <laughs> What a fucking guy. <laughs> nice, Carl. Uh, so while we have Carl here in the channel, I'm working on a story up here. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about this story a little bit while we have Carl here. Okay, so what I know of this story so far, or what I knew at the beginning of the day, was um, there is a an energy plant in New York that had investment from private equity, and they are using the energy facility to mine Bitcoin in order to cool their servers. They're pulling water from the lake, cooling down their graphics cards and then they're pumping that hot water back into uh, the lake now it seems that there are some things happening behind the scenes on this story and we got a couple of pieces of information from your environment Seattle so I started a tweet thread Uh, here, tweeting at uh, Anthony Pompliano, a really big Bitcoin maximalist, and Michael Saylor, Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, hotter water leads to fish die-offs, which lead to algal blooms, which lead to fish die-offs. What will be done about operations like these? And then Carl responded, this is the reason Cuomo denied a water permit to four gigawatts of clean energy. And there are other other pieces about this so here's the original story and then we're going to get into the information that Carl shared with us here okay so local residents say a power plant is heating Seneca Lake and emitting huge amounts of greenhouse gases the gas fired plant is used to power at least 8,000 computers that are mining Bitcoin the plant CEO says it's operating within the law and has created wait for it 31 jobs whoa watch out Local residents have blamed Bitcoin mining for heating up the largest of the Finger Lakes in upstate New York. Their complaints center on a gas-fired power plant that's being used to power 8,000 Bitcoin mining computers. The power plant, Greenage, which is being closely monitored by the Department of Environmental Conservation, is allowed to suck in 139 million gallons of water and discharge 135 million gallons per day. The discharge water can be as hot as 108 degrees in the summer and 86 degrees in the winter, per permit documents viewed by NBC News. The lake is so warm that you feel like you're in a hot tub. A private equity firm Atlas Holdings bought the disused coal-powered site next to Seneca Lake in 2014 and reopened it as a natural gas plant in 2017. At first, the plant only generated energy for the grid when demand was high, but in 2019, they started using the plant to power Bitcoin mining to make higher profits from surplus energy. They have at least 8,000 computers, and they're considering installing more as it plans to ramp up the Bitcoin mining capacity to 45 megawatts by December. But it's leading to a huge spike in emissions. Regulatory documents viewed by environmental campaign group Earth Justice show that the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions and nitrous oxide emissions each grew nearly tenfold between January and December as it ramped up their mining. A former Environmental Protection Agency regional administrator said New York would not meet its greenhouse gas emission reduction if they continued mining Bitcoin. The environmental impact of the plant has never been better than it is right now, they claim. They claim that they're operating within their environmental limits. Why? 
because they are gonna buy carbon credits to offset their emissions. So here's gonna. So here's how the world's gonna go. There's gonna be boom bust towns at energy plants around lakes. The energy plant is gonna be bought up by a proof of work miner. They're going to mine everything that they can. They're going to dump all of the heat back into the lake. They're going to leave the region unhabitable. And then they're going to buy carbon credit offsets. And say, oh no, we're fine. See, we're, we're meeting ESG. We're, we're meeting all of your rules and regulations. There's nothing to see here. There's no lake die off. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so then this story ties into Indian Point. And now these are some things that I am not as familiar about. So supposedly there was an effort to oh was Indian Point a nuclear facility that they shut down? Oh okay, yeah. So there was a nuclear facility that they closed which was providing cleaner energy than the fossil fuels. There was a May 2015 transformer fire, which sent thousands of gallons of oil into the Hudson. They're claiming there were other radioactive releases into the groundwater, failed accident drills, and inadequate disaster planning. They claim they're also over a seismic zone. Okay, so they are literally on top of the Hudson. No, literally on top of the Hudson. Hello, Moose Cup. It's going pretty well. Good to see you once again. Okay, so they shut down the nuclear facility, but they're not shutting down the natural gas facility. They denied them a water permit. Oh, wow, look at this. <laughs> so they were denied additional water in 2010 with the claim that outmoding cool outmoded cooling technology at the Indian Point nuclear plant kills many Hudson River fish. So they're claiming that they were dumping too hot of water back into the Hudson. And it was killing short-nosed sturgeon. They also say that radioactive material polluted the Hudson after leaking into groundwater. The water is then pumped back into the Hudson 20 or 30 degrees hotter. So both intake enormous volumes of water combined 2.5 billion gallons a day. And they were saying sucking so much water causes plankton, eggs, and larvae to be drawn into the plant's machinery or entrained, and the water pressure also causes fish to be trapped or impinged against the intake screens. Hmm. Mm -hmm. They wanted to convert to a closed cycle cooling system. Would have been better, but they were denied their ability to. Hmm.
Okay, now we're back on to Green Edge's Bitcoin mining operations. Excessive thermal pollution and lack of fish protection screens present serious hazard to the health of Seneca Lake and are strongly opposed by Seneca Pure Waters together. So they're allowed to intake 134 million gallons of water per day and they can dump it back in up to 108 Fahrenheit and 86 Fahrenheit in the winter. There's no screens to stop fish from going through it and now it's leading to harmful algal blooms. No impacts on public health and safety are expected as a result of the leakage from the Indian Point groundwater contamination, leaking tritium. Uh, they say the water will slowly migrate into Hudson over the course of many months. The concentrations will be extremely low after entering the waterway because of significant dilution. Hmm. Here's a... Whoa. It's from February 1969 report. Hmm. The 2017 report is the post-Fukushima audit. Oh, this would take me a very long time to read. I'm trying to, I can see like little parts of it here, but yeah, I would have to, I have to know more about like tritium dilution into large bodies of water and the um, negative effects of that. I'm, I'm just not informed enough there. But that's a little bit of a story that, you know, maybe, maybe some people aren't uh, talking about as much. Okay, hello uh, Biohaz. We are going to continue pushing through the day here. Did you miss the bit? bit yeah, we just, I mean, if you want to go back in VOD time, like by 15 minutes, we literally just did it. Literally just done. Okay, uh, in a good story, the best Venmo alternatives to avoid fees. I'm going to be giving people more options of ways to support the channel in the future because PayPal is getting too expensive. So I'm going to be testing out Cash App. We're going to be testing out Venmo. We're going to be testing out PayPal and, and so forth. Okay, how to avoid Venmo fees. You can send money to friends instead of for goods and services without fees. Make sure that you don't use a credit card for those transactions and the service is free. Venmo will, Venmo will charge you a fee if you make an instant transfer. You can avoid it by making a standard bank transfer, which takes one to three business days, or by using a transfer system from your bank. There's also Zelle. Zelle is arguably your best Venmo alternative. You can access Zelle in the mobile app from your bank. If it's not offered at your bank, you can directly download the Zelle app. If the person to whom you send money doesn't have the app, Zelle will send them a text or email message to alert them to the payment and explain how they can obtain it. Payment is usually available immediately. Fees, zero. Uh, and actually, I used Zelle this morning because I lost my debit card for Fulton Bank, so I had to open a new bank account uh, with PNC, and I had to yeah, I had to Zelle my money over that way. So it was an it was a hassle to get it set up, but it actually did work out. Uh, Cash App. 
you can use Cash App if you link your debit card, then you can use the app to send either cash or Bitcoin. There are no fees if you send or transfer money via debit cards. It's usually available in one to three days. If you send payment via a credit card or send a one-day payment, you will pay 3% and 1.5% fees respectively. Wow. Google Pay is similar to the others. If you use a debit card, you pay a fee of 1.5% or 31 cents, whichever is higher. If you transfer money with a credit card or a bank account, there is no fee. Facebook Messenger, really? You have to use a bank-issued debit card or PayPal account to make the transfers. There are no fees from Facebook. Hmm. Interesting. At the moment, we just have uh, PayPal, and I think my Cash App is Touring News. Uh, is that Cat? Yeah, that's my Cash App. Uh, sticking within the currency, payment, staking, Bitcoin, energy, proof of stake, proof of work, digital asset, cryptocurrency realm. JP Morgan eyes Ethereum staking as a fast growing revenue opportunity. The investment bank has its eyes on Ethereum 2.0 and what it means for the crypto industry. They believe in the power of staking, the more energy efficient way of creating and distributing cryptocurrencies. They report that cryptocurrency staking overall makes the crypto ecosystem more attractive an, as an asset class because it could be a major source of revenue for retail and institutional investors. Staking is a system in which users agree to lock up money in a network in order to help validate its transactions. These kind of crypto networks run on something called proof of stake. Proof of <coughs> work is used by lots of cryptocurrency networks including Ethereum at the moment to validate transactions. It works by using lots of computers to solve complex puzzles, which in turn keep the network running smoothly. It uses huge amounts of energy, big carbon footprint of Bitcoin. A number of other cryptocurrencies are using what is called proof of stake, which is more environmentally friendly. It doesn't require mining to create and distribute a network's given currency. Ethereum is going to upgrade to use proof of stake instead of proof of work, which will be the end of Ethereum mining. JP Morgan said in their new report, a primer on staking, the fastest growing opportunity for the cryptocurrency intermediaries and their clients, the proof of stake will become more attractive when Ethereum upgrade is completed and could grow to be a $40 billion industry by 2025. That number is too low. We estimate that staking is currently a $9 billion business and will grow to $20 billion following the Ethereum merge and $40 billion by 2025. Hmm. I'm curious about their paper. I may check it out sometime. Okay. Uh, in the best story of the day, in an actual good news story, solar device generates electricity and desalinates water with no waste brine. To longtime viewers of this channel, you'll know that this is a massive technological advancement, if true. A device that can generate electricity while desalinating seawater has been developed by researchers in Saudi Arabia and China, who claim that their new system is highly efficient at performing both tasks. The device uses waste heat from the solar cell for desalination, thereby cooling the solar cell. It also produces no concentrated brine as waste. There are 16,000 desalination plants around the world producing 95 million cubic meters of fresh water every day. However, current desal systems can be very expensive and energy hungry, producing significant carbon emissions. The process can also produce highly concentrated salt water or brine as well as fresh water. This brine can also contain toxic chemicals introduced during the desal process and can have negative environmental impacts. Now, we Bin Wong, at King Abdul University of Science and Tech and Saudi Arabian colleagues claim to have developed a new device called a PV membrane distillation evaporative crystallizer that combines efficient desal and electricity generation. 
It consists of a solar panel on top of a multi-stage membrane distillation component. The MSMD uses waste heat from the solar cell to drive water evaporation and is designed to collect and reuse latent heat from the vapor condensation in each distillation stage to drive evaporation in the next stage. So I guess this is the big part. A solar panel on top of a multi-stage membrane distillation component. It uses waste heat from the solar cell to drive water evaporation and is designed to collect and reuse latent heat from the vapor condensation in each distillation stage to drive evaporation in the next stage. In laboratory tests simulating solar illumination at an ambient temperature of 24 centigrade, the temperature of the solar cell on the PME was around 14 centigrade cooler than an identical solar cell not mounted on an MSMD component. This led to 8% more electricity production compared to the bare solar cell. In the same test, the PME produced fresh water from seawater at a rate of about 2.4 kilograms per m squared h. Unsure what that is, I apologize, which is almost double that previously reported for a combined solar and desal device. The high desal performance of this design is attributed to the recycling of the latent heat of vapor condensation. Cubic meters per hour? Okay, yeah, fair. Each of the five stages of the MSMD consists of four parts, a thermal conduction layer, an evaporation layer, a hydrophobic membrane, and a condensation layer. The conduction layer transports heat from the solar cell or previous distillation stage to the evaporation layer. Seawater flows into the evaporation layer and driven by the heat, some water evaporates. The water vapor then passes through a porous hydrophobic membrane and condenses in the condensation layer as fresh water. The MSMD device sits on an evaporative crystallizer that uses latent heat from the last distillation phase to evaporate off the liquid from the final concentrated brine that is produced alongside the fresh water, leaving behind only solid salt. Evaporation and condensation through the system is governed by the vapor pressure gradient between the evaporation layer and the condensation layer in each stage. A theoretical model suggests that the hydrophobic membranes are key to achieving simultaneous PV cooling and a high rate of water production. If you have brine, you can't do desalination because you have to dump the brine back into the ocean and it kills the ground and it kills the ecosystem at the bottom of the ocean. So the biggest problem with desal right now is what you do with the brine water because pumping it back into the ocean is a pollutant. But if you can not have the brine water and harvest the salt, then you're actually this is legitimately coming very close to actually fucking helping the world. <laughs> like th this is actually important. <laughs> it's the first piece of like really good news that I've come across in a while. A and we have the whole whoops, we have the paper here too. So this is their big uh research paper. I thought I had the whole piece of it somehow. Get rights and content. Well, yeah, just let me fucking read it. Yeah, the salt is fine, but you can use the salt. Yeah, the salt. Yeah, the salt can be used. There isn't really. There isn't really a way. Um, to make salt from the brine at the moment, Nico Lump, because of the scale that you'd have it at. The key development with this device is the utilization of the hydrophobic membrane with a low thickness and high porosity, which is guided by our theoretical model. Previous work mainly utilized the hydrophobic membrane with a high thickness to reduce the ther thermal conduction loss, and our theoretical model found that the reducing of thickness of hydrophobic membrane can achieve a high desal performance and low solar temperature simultaneously. Okay, so this is making a little bit of sense to me. So a problem with photovoltaics at the moment is they heat up right now. And if you do agrovoltaics, which is the combined process of building uh, photovoltaic systems above a working farm, 
the working farm down below it and the growth down below it can reduce the temperatures of the photovoltaics up above it, and thereby allowing them to generate electricity more efficiently and requiring less watering for the crops down below. So it seems to be that a big issue with current photovoltaics of the moment is overheating and a loss of ability for uh, more efficient electricity generation. So if you're able to combine a cooling system that you could think about like using in your computer, like if you're combining a liquid cooling system into your photovoltaics in addition with a desalination system that completely separates the water vapor from the salt behind, now you're getting more efficient solar energy, panel, solar energy panels, you're getting clean water, and you're getting salt as a byproduct. So if this actually works, this is what's needed. So here's a graphic abstract. Okay, so you evaporate, condensate, evaporate, condensate, evaporate, condensate, and then at the end you get your brine. But I guess the end brine would be salt. Is anybody subscribed to Joule? Or can anybody get this paper? I don't know how to get these kind of things. Sci-Hub? Well, they said it's not still brine because they said that they're producing um, complete salt out the back end. I don't know how Sci-Hub works. Request your institution. I'm an institution. How much is it to purchase? I'm just curious. Hello, good afternoon. What does that mean? If anybody can help me with this. That's one of the papers. You all have to remember here, I'm, uh, I'm not very tech savvy. The paper is called Integrated Solar Driven PV Cooling and Seawater Desalination with Zero Liquid Discharge. Wow, I'm actually happy. <laughs> I, I, this is actually like what we need. Uh, while some people are working on that, we are going to keep going through the stories. We're up to 83 tabs now, uh, but we're making progress because we've been to here already. So we've got maybe like 30 more to go. Yeah, not even 30. We're going to get through this. Okay. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything from back here. Okay, we got Bezos. Oh, no, I did miss this one. Okay. The Mexico water supply buckles on a worsening drought, putting crops at risk. So I'm imagining that there's also a problem with uh, U.S.-Mexico water rights, because I remember along the 
border, uh, there was a farm town in Mexico where the farmers took up arms against the National Guard and overtook a dam as the United States was trying to say, we're not going to send as much water down to you as we were before. And the Mexican government was kind of like acquiescing, bending the knee and like, you know, throating the dictator to the north. Rains were only 3% below average across Mexico as a whole last year. The strain on water reserves was exacerbated by increased domestic demand during the COVID-19 pandemic. Temperatures are going to hit 40 degrees Celsius on Wednesday in parts of northern Mexico. This article is five days old. Seventy percent of Mexico is impacted by drought up half up from about half in December. A fifth of the country is experiencing extreme drought. Seventy seven of two hundred ten principal reservoirs are below twenty five percent capacity at the end of June. This time last year only fifty six were below that capacity. Two years ago there were just forty. And also, as your temperature gets higher and higher, you're losing more moisture to evapotranspiration as well. Terry Branstead thinks that carbon capture investments will drive economic growth in rural Iowa and beyond. <coughs> He's been a senior policy advisor to the newly formed Summit Carbon Solutions as they prepare to initiate their Midwest Carbon Express project. It's a $4.5 billion investment, <coughs> expected to be the single largest carbon capture and storage project in the world by connecting more than 30 ethanol facilities in Iowa, Minnesota, North Dakota, and Nebraska. This critical infrastructure investment will be capable of safely capturing and permanently storing 12 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. It's the equivalent of taking 2.6 million cars off our roads annually and represents one of the most consequential steps we can take toward reaching net zero emissions. 12 million tons per year. It's really not that much for $4.5 billion worth of investment. At all. It's not much at all. Ethanol is not going to become net zero or carbon negative. That's not true. Oh, man, I don't like this article at all. Okay, so here's what they're thinking they can do. They think that they can capture carbon, put it into an injection well, dump the injection well down into a permeable reservoir and allow a little bit of leakage to come up into the cap rock and then monitor it with another well. Ooh, 350 to 460 permanent jobs once the project is operational. Wow. Wow. So for a million dollars, you're getting a job. No. Ten million dollars per job. Nice. Yeah, that's really going to work out. That's really going to go well for you. I would like to live part of my world in this color of light. I would be I would be okay existing in uh in that room for a little while not forever but for a little while I, I like this Oh yeah Yeah I'm I was all about um like the Blade Runner 
Uh, orange world. Yeah, I'm cool. Orange is one of my favorite colors. It's more like yellow. Well, I'm colorblind, but uh, this part is orange to me. Only partially color blind. The tech Cold War's most complicated machine that's out of China's reach. A $150 million chip making tool from a Dutch company has become a lever in the United States Chinese struggle. It also shows how entrenched the global supply chain is. A massive machine sold by a Dutch company has emerged as a key lever for policymakers and illustrates how any company's hopes of building a completely self sufficient supply chain and semiconductor technology are unrealistic. The machine is made by ASML Holding, based in Veldhoven. It uses a different kind of light to define ultra-small circuitry on chips, packing more performance into the small slices of silicon. The tool, which took decades to develop and was introduced for high-volume manufacturing in 2017, cost more than $150 million. Shipping it to customers requires 40 shipping containers, 20 trucks, and 3 Boeing 747s. No, I just have a story to talk about Assange for later. The complex machine is widely acknowledged as necessary for making the most advanced chips and ability with geopolitical implications. The Trump administration successfully lobbied the Dutch government to block shipments of such a machine to China in 2019. And the Biden administration has shown no signs of reversing that stance. Wow. Manufacturers cannot produce leading edge chips without the system. And it's only made by the Dutch firm. They concluded that it would take China a decade to build its own similar equipment. Interesting. The machine has effectively turned into a choke point in the supply chain for chips, which act as the brain of computers and other digital devices. The tools, maybe you're the one that is more colorblind than us. The tools, three continent development and production, using expertise and parts from Japan, the United States, and Germany, is also a reminder of just how global the supply chain is, providing a reality check for any country that wants to leap ahead in semiconductors by itself. That includes not only China, but the United States, where Congress is debating plans to spend more than $50 billion to reduce reliance on foreign chip manufacturers. Many branches of the federal government, particularly the Pentagon, have been worried about the United States' dependence on Taiwan's leading chip manufacturer and the island's proximity to China. A study this spring by Boston Consulting Group and the Semiconductor Industry Association estimated that creating a self-sufficient chip supply chain would take a trillion dollars and sharply increase prices for chips and products made with them. The situation underscores the crucial role played by ASML, a once obscure company whose market value now exceeds $285 billion. Wow. It's the most important company you've never heard of. <laughs> I'll say. Created in 1984 by the electronics giant Philips and another toolmaker, Advanced Semiconductor Materials International became an independent company and by far the biggest supplier of chip manufacturing equipment that involves a process called lithography. Manufacturers repeatedly project patterns of chip circuitry onto silicon wafers. The more tiny transistors and other components that can be added to the individual chip, the more powerful it becomes and the more data it can store. They began studying a shift to using extreme ultraviolet or EUV light. It has ultra-small wavelengths that can create much more tinier circuitry than is possible with conventional lithography. They decided to make machines based on the tech, an effort that cost $8 billion since the late 90s. The development process quickly went global, and they now assemble the advanced machines using mirrors from Germany and hardware developed in San Diego that generates light by blasting tin droplets with a laser. Key chemicals and components come from Japan. 
A lack of money in the company's early years led it to integrate inventions from specialty suppliers, creating what he calls a collaborative knowledge network that innovates quickly. They built on other international cooperation. In the early 1980s, researchers in the United States, Japan, and Europe began considering the radical shift in light sources. The concept was taken up by a consortium that included Intel and two other U.S. chip makers, as well as DOE Labs. They joined in 99 after more than a year of negotiations. That development was made trickier by the quirks of extreme ultraviolet light. Lithography machines usually focus light through lenses to project circuit patterns onto wafers, but the small EOV wavelengths are absorbed by glass, so lenses won't work. Mirrors, another common tool to direct, have the same problem. That meant the new lithography required mirrors with complex coatings that combined to better reflect small wavelengths. They turned to Zeiss Group, a 175-year-old German optics company and longtime partner. Oh, for sure, head of Romaine. Its contributions included a two-ton projection system to handle extreme ultraviolet light with six specially shaped mirrors that are ground, polished, and coated over several months in an elaborate robotic process that uses ion beams to remove defects. Generating sufficient light to project images quickly also caused delays, but Chimer, a San Diego company that ASML bought in 2013, eventually improved a system that directs pulses from a high-powered laser to hit droplets of tin 50,000 times a second, once to flatten them and a second to vaporize them to create intense light. It also required redesigned components called photon masks, photo masks, which act like stencils in projecting circuit designs as well as new chemicals deposited on wafers that generate those images when exposed to light. Japanese companies now supply most of the products. Customers have bought about 100 of these very fancy things. Samsung and TSMC, the biggest service producing chips designed by other companies. TSMC uses the tool to make the processor designed by Apple for the latest iPhones. Intel and IBM have said EUV is crucial to their plans. It's definitely the most complicated machine humans have built. Dutch restrictions on exporting such machines to China which have been enforced since 2019, haven't had much financial impact on them since there's a backlog of orders from other countries. Of course there's a backlog. Hmm. Interesting article. I'm going to take a very quick uh, stretch break and walk, you know, about every hour that I stream I try to stand up and walk around a little bit. Is there a backlog of orders for the subsidiary production partners? Uh, I would assume the backlog goes deep through the chain. Okay.
AC feels great, but it's terrible for the planet. Here is how to fix that. We may come even closer during the cooling war when the rising number of Americans with air conditioners and a refrigerant industry that fought regulation nearly obliterated the ozone layer. We avoided the catastrophe, but the fundamental problem of air conditioning has never really been resolved. Mechanical cooling appeared in the 1900s, <coughs> not for comfort, but for business. In manufacturing, the regulation of temperature process cooling controlled the quality of commodities, cotton, tobacco, and chewing gum. Alfred Wolf installed the first cooling system for people at the New York Stock Exchange because comfortable traders yielded considerably higher stock returns, of course. Only in the 20s did commercial cooling appear. Theaters previously shut down in the summer. However, Willis Carrier debuted the first centrifugal air conditioning system at the Rivoli Theater in Midtown Manhattan on Memorial Day weekend. 1925. With air conditioning, the Rivoli became the talk of Broadway and inaugurated the summer blockbuster. Before World War II, almost no one had AC at home. It was kind of dangerous. Chemical refrigerants like sulfur dioxide and methyl chloride filled most fridges and coolers and leaks could kill a child, poison a hospital floor, or blow up a basement. Everything changed with the invention of Freon in 1928. Non-toxic, non-explosive Freon was hailed as a miracle. It made the modernist skyscraper with its sealed windows and heat-absorbing materials possible. We actually have an article about this as well. Uh, about how a lot of buildings were built for a different time. Uh, this one right here. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, we're going to tie this story into this story. Most buildings were designed for an earlier climate. Here's what will happen as global warming accelerates. It made living in the desert possible. Hello, Lexmix Games. Good to see you. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome to the news team. Very kind of you. The small winter resort of Phoenix, Arizona became a year-round attraction. Architecture can now ignore local climate. Anywhere could be 65 degrees Fahrenheit with 55% humidity. Cheap materials made boxy suburban tract housing affordable to most Americans, but the sealed-up, stifling design of these homes required air conditioning to keep the heat at bay. AC transitioned from luxury to necessity. By 1980, more than half of all U.S. homes were air-conditioned, and despite millions of black Americans fleeing the violence of Jim Crow, the South saw greater in-migration than out-migration for the first time, a direct result of AC. The American car was similarly transformed. In 1995, 10% of American cars had AC. 30 years later, it was standard. <coughs> the cooling boom also altered the way we worked. Americans could work anywhere at any hour of the day. Early ads for air conditioning promised not health or comfort, but productivity. The workday could proceed no matter the season or the climate. Even in the home, AC brought comfort as a means to rest up before the next workday. Oh, hey. Announcement, everybody. While there's 52 of you here, I'm at the, the most viewers that I've had today, so I might as well make it the announcement. I am going to Nebraska to go visit the greenhouse in the snow. So I've made up... Uh, I've made up my mind. I was thinking about not going to Nebraska because it is 1,100 miles of a drive, uh, but we're going to go for it. So on Thursday, I'm going to be leaving Lexington, uh, at the latest on Thursday, I'll be leaving Lexington, Kentucky to begin the drive to Nebraska. I'm probably going to try to do like, I don't know, maybe, maybe do the drive over like two days, unless if I know, if you live in between if you live in Louisville Mount Vernon St. Louis Columbia Kansas City Lincoln Omaha if any of you live in any of these places 
let me know because I would uh, I'd be happy to visit. I will be there for about three or four days in Alliance, Nebraska. I'm going to be taking a couple tours of the greenhouse in the snow. Uh, that way I can get all the film footage that I want. So just a channel update for everybody. The, the trip uh, does continue. I may make it out there eventually, head of Romaine. I kind of want to do some reporting on the fires out there. My concern is I drive a 1995 vehicle with 225,000 miles on it, and I don't really want to be driving it in 110 degree heat. In addition, its air conditioning isn't going to work in 110 degree heat, so I got some decisions to make. But I will be going to Colorado. I don't really know where I'm headed to. I don't have a plan. Uh, luckily, I'm not paying rent this year. I kind of, I'm sort of living at my grandmother's house. So I, um, my only cost is uh, just eating and uh, keeping gas in the car. So we, uh, I can kind of stretch the trip really as long as I want to. As it turned out, Freon isn't exactly non-toxic. Freon is a chlorofluorocarbon, which depletes the ozone layer and also acts as a global warming gas. By 1974, the industrial world was churning out CFCs, chemicals that had n never appeared on the planet in any significant quantities at a rate of 1 million metric tons a year, the equivalent mass of more than 500,000 cars. That was the year atmospheric chemists Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina first hypothesized that the chlorine molecules in CFCs might be destroying ozone in the stratosphere by bonding to free oxygen atoms and disrupting the atmosphere's delicate chemistry. Oh, I'll definitely, I'll definitely be there. Um, yeah, I'll definitely be around, uh, around Denver for sure. Cause I know a lot of people in Colorado, Bobby. So I do plan on going to Colorado after Nebraska because I think that I can find like a couch or two to crash on. I think uh, A4 Andre might be out there. I think, um, oh, you don't have to dox yourself, don't worry. HFCs are still used for high density transformers. They're a major component in the electricity grid. Hmm. The ozone layer absorbs the worst of the sun's ultraviolet radiation. Without the stratospheric ozone, life we know it's impossible. A 1% decline in ozone layer's thickness results in thousands of new cases of skin cancer. Greater depletion could lead to crop failures, the collapse of oceanic food, and eventually the destruction of all life on Earth. Geophysicist Josef Farman confirmed the Roland Molina hypothesis when he detected a near absence of ozone over Antarctica. The ozone hole. <coughs> a fierce battle ensued, but in 87 the United States signed the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer, which ended Freon production. It remains the world's only successful international environmental treaty with legally binding emissions targets. Annual conferences to reassess the goals of the treaty make it a living document, which is revised in light of up-to-the-date scientific data. For instance, the Montreal Protocol set out only to slow production of CFCs, but by 1997, industrialized countries stopped production entirely, far sooner than was thought possible. The world was saved through global cooperations. The trouble is, as your environment Seattle, exclamation mark, your environment Seattle. Refrigerants replacing CFCs are hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, turned out to be terrible for the planet too. While they have no, oh nice. While they have no, they have an, uh, blah, blah, blah. while they have an ozone depleting potential of zero, they are potent greenhouse gases. They absorb infrared radiation from the sun and earth and block heat that normally escapes into outer space. Carbon dioxide and methane do this too, but HFCs trap heat at rates thousands of times higher. Although the number of refrigerant molecules in the atmosphere is far fewer, their destructive force is far greater. 
Today, HFCs provide power to almost any air condition in the home, in the office, the supermarket, or the car. They cool vaccines, blood for transfusions, and temperature-sensitive medications, as well as the data processors and computer servers that back up the internet. Everything from the cloud to blockchains. In 2019, annual global warming emissions from HFCs were the equivalent of 175 million metric tons of CO2. In May, the EPA signaled it will begin phasing down HFCs and replacing them with more climate-friendly alternatives. Experts agreed that a swift end could prevent as much as 0.5 degrees centigrade of warming over the next century. Regardless of the refrigerant used, cooling still requires energy. Air conditioning accounts for nearly one-fifth of United States residential electricity usage. One-fifth. Wow, 67 viewers. Uh, hello, all of you. Thank you for coming over either... Well, thank you for tuning in, I assume, after Lucid Fox ended their stream. I appreciate your viewership and support. This is more energy for cooling overall and per capita than in any other nation. Most Americans consider the cost of energy only in terms of their electricity bill, but it's also costing the planet. Comfort cooling began not as a survival strategy, but as a business venture. Comfort cooling began not only as a survival strategy, but as a business venture. It still carries all those symbolic meanings, though its currency now works globally, cleaving the world into civilized cooling and barbaric heat. Despite what we assume as a means of weathering a heat wave, individual air conditioning is terribly ineffective. It works only for those who can afford it, but even then, their use in urban areas only makes the surrounding microclimate hotter, sometimes by a factor of 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's because you're outputting hot air, you're intaking the cool air actively threatening the lives to those who don't have access to cooling. The sociologist Eric Kleinenberg has brilliantly studied how in a 1995 Chicago heat wave, about twice as many people died than in a comparable heat wave 40 years earlier due to the city's neglect of certain neighborhoods and social infrastructure. Ironically, research suggests that exposure to constant air conditioning can prevent our bodies from acclimating, acclimatizing to hot weather I um I actually understand that. So those who subject themselves to thermal monotony are, in the end, making themselves more vulnerable to heat-related illness. I've been training on this trip to be prepared in the heat. Wow, that guy he needs to tie his hair up or he's going to be too hot. Touring funds for touring news. Holy shit, bio has. Um... Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, that gets it. That gets the car like 65 or 70 percent of the way to Nebraska. God damn. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if it weren't for a few um, key large donations. Oh, was there a was it loud on stream? I didn't even hear it. Uh, yeah, here, I'll turn it down. But yeah, I didn't even hear it. Uh, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, touring funds for touring news. Yeah, that goes uh, a long way. I'm actually also, I'm considering soon, um, releasing my bank account statements, uh, each month to kind of like force me into being even like better with managing resources. Uh, so I'm kind of like, I'm kind of trying to evaluate, can I actually open up like all of my books, uh, for like critique and evaluation and see if that could spur me to being even like, um, better able to deploy limited resources. Um, because like, you know, I've talked a couple times here. Thank you so much. Uh, bio has, um, you're the one that got me to touch my first B frame. And now you're basically the person getting me to Nebraska. So I, I really do, I do thank you. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, I've wanted to become like even like further transparent or, you know, better. And one thing that has made me better is uh, chat with Relly. He'll rake you over the coals for wasteful spending. Oh, is he, is he pretty good at like uh, not wasting money? What's up, Andre? Um... Yeah, so the um, 
the the being in front of a public uh, camera all the time has turned me into a lot better person than I'd have been able to become by myself, full stop. So I'm wondering if I do open up my books, is that going to, yeah, is that going to make me better? And I think it would. So I'm kind of I'm considering moving into that venture and allowing, yeah, kind of like just a, a further public inspection to see if that can help me get even, y you know, a little bit more efficient there. Air conditioning only works when you have the electricity to power it. During heat waves, he only got a cell phone in December and only because he was traveling for the election stuff. Wow. I didn't know that he was that good about that kind of stuff. Damn. Hmm. Okay, I am going to talk to him about that then. During heat waves, when air conditioning is needed most, blackouts are frequent. On Sunday... With afternoon temperatures reaching 112 degrees Fahrenheit around Portland, the power grid failed for more than 6,300 residents under control by Portland General Electrics. Yeah, damn. I mean, I, I thought that I was good at stretching a dollar, but I didn't know that he stretched his that far. Uh, all right, so I have, a new, uh, I have a new person to talk to, listen to, and learn from. We're talking about the Twitch streamer twitch.tv forward slash uh, relevant. Uh, we were helped today by twitch.tv forward slash your environment Seattle. We were also raided today by twitch.tv forward slash bleep blump Ben. And now I'm talking with twitch.tv forward slash sourcing support. Uh, one of my long term friends uh, from the platform. The troubled story history with air conditioning suggests that we chuck it, not that we chuck it entirely, rather than individual cooling on the, okay, that, thank you. Oh, you were faster than I, damn, I was right there too, but you were quick. The troubled history of air conditioning suggests not that we chuck it entirely, but that we focus on public cooling, on public comfort, comfort rather than individual cooling and individual comfort, big agree. Ensuring that the most vulnerable among the planet's human inhabitants can keep cool through better access to public cooling centers shade giving trees, safe green spaces, water infrastructure to cool, and smart design will not only enrich our cities overall, it'll lower the temperature for everyone. I agree. I big agree. Okay, so stories that we have coming up here still are uh, Bezos and Gates backing fake meat and dairy made from fungus. Uh, it's just something that has to be read. Most buildings were designed for an earlier climate. Here's what will happen as global warming accelerates. As China's foreign currency deposits pass one trillion yuan or one trillion dollars, banks face an unwanted headache uh, pressure on the yuan. Uh, a tribe becomes the key water player with drought aid to Arizona. Uh, Sinopec builds China's first large carbon capture sequestration project. Uh, oppressive heat continues across the West. Uh, I don't know if I'll have time to do this one today, but if not, we'll do it tomorrow. 60 years of climate change warnings, the signs that were missed and ignored. Uh, drought, the end of California's groundwater free-for-all. Uh, JP Morgan and Goldman are calling time's up on work from home. Uh, oh, this one is probably what we're doing next. As Lebanon's crisis deepens, lines for fuel grow. Uh, food and medicine are scarce. We covered the uh, Polk County water assessments. Uh, this is you know lobbying from big business and big government. Uh, asset owners managing six trillion dollars call for global carbon price. Uh, that's a similar article from there. We've got new United States rules to protect animal farmers are expected soon. Republicans are weighing cracking down on cities to doom Democrats. Uh, this is about a redistricting and a gerrymandering. Uh, TikTok is taking the book industry by storm and retailers are taking notice. The Suez Canal says a deal has been reached to free the seized vessel. Um, I don't think I can read Market Watch. Okay, I can read Reuters. Uh, Bank of Japan is launching a new scheme for fighting climate change and keeps policy steady. Uh, LIDAR updates. Uh, a big article about Julian Assange debunking some of the common myths about him. Echoes of 1989 as foreign forces withdraw from Afghanistan. Uh, more than a billion seashore animals have cooked to death in the British Columbia heat wave, says a UBC researcher. 
Uh, San Marino adopts a non-fungible token vaccine passport. What we've learned after a month of operating a hybrid office. Uh, almonds swept California farms, then the water ran out. <coughs> and I think that's what we have left. So we're going to try to get through about uh, a good portion of these. I do want to cover this one about Lebanon. So thank you so much, Biohaz. Uh, that um, really does make sure that the trip is going to be able to continue. Just doing something in the background very fast. As Lebanon's crisis deepens, lines for fuel grow, and food and medicine are scarce. The World Bank said the financial crisis could rank among the world's three worst since the 1800s. Oh my God. The currency has lost more than 90% of its value, and unemployment has skyrocketed. If anybody remembers 2019 from this channel, we covered the depegging of the Lebanese pound from the dollar. We talked about the uh, development of an illegal market uh, where you know certain currencies had a higher value than others, depending on if they were in physical or digital form. Uh, we covered the Beirut blast. We covered the political corruption. Uh, we covered the inflation. We covered the runaway inflation. We covered the Syrian refugee crisis that was taking place there. And there's just a huge confluence of a perfect storm embroiling Lebanon at the moment right now. As she sat in the sun in her Mini Cooper, inching her way through a line of cars to get gas, Lynn Husami tried to use her time well. She had a phone meeting with the advisor of her master's thesis, called an old friend, and played video games on her Nintendo Switch. After four hours, she still hadn't reached the station, was drenched in sweat, and needed a bathroom, but she feared losing her place in line. I'm hopeless. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. It's getting worse, and we can't do anything about it. I don't know how we can fix all this. Their currency has lost more than 90% of the value since the fall of 2019, and that's when they depegged the currency from the dollar. So please, everybody, never, never, ever peg your currency to the dollar. The absolute worst thing that you can do. Absolute worst thing you can do. Yeah, but you have to remember that that Mini Cooper and Switch could have been bought before the currency crisis. And also, so what if she has them anyway? The double blow, the pandemic, and the huge explosion in the Beirut port, and also global remittance payments is are way down from uh, Lebanese expats sending money back into the nation. Um, has just made it horrid. Uh, the crisis threatens to add a new element of volatility to a country at the center of the Middle East that was once a cultural and financial hub and now hosts one million uh, refugees from neighboring Syria. All but the wealthiest are spending their days sweating through frequent blackouts, waiting in fuel lines that wrap around city blocks, and running from pharmacy to pharmacy to search for medicines that have disappeared. The GDP has plummeted by 40% to $33 billion from $55 billion in 2018. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Per capita income fell by the same percentage, leaving more than half the population poor. This isn't exactly true. This isn't true. It's mostly from just not having enough money to pay the dollars that were owed. They've been raising the price of subsidized bread, reducing electricity production, and subsidizing imports of fuel medicine and grain to the tune of 500 million per month from the central bank's dwindling reserves. Well, that's what's going on because they're having to pay for everything in dollars and forex sharks are shorting their currency to lead to hyperinflation. Oh 
Hassan Diab, the caretaker prime minister, when he resigned in August of last year, said many of the problems are systemic corruption that not only deeply rooted in all functions of the state, but are bigger than the state and so powerful that they cannot confront or get rid of it. Now they're climbing stairs because elevators lack power, they cut out on meat or they skip meals because food prices have jumped, and they're wasting large parts of their j day just to keep their cars moving. One left his car in neutral and was pushing it through a long line outside a Beirut gas station to preserve as much of its scarce fuel as possible. He took a break from his job at a local shoe company to get gas and been stuck in line so long he was now late getting back to work. Gray hair and jeans were matted with sweat and he had stripped down to a white tank top to try and keep cool. Fuck. I actually have tentative plans to go to Turkey and Lebanon in September of this year with a friend because uh, I wanted to interview people about this crisis. Um, so I do have like 30% tentative plans of trying to get there this fall. His house only has a few hours a day of electricity from the grid, and he could afford only a few more hours from a private generator, not enough to make it through the muggy summer nights. The mosquitoes come and then the heat left him tired at work where his monthly salary of 1.2 million Lebanese pounds, which had been worth 800 before the crisis, was now worth less than 80 fucking dollars. While talking about the financial pressures on his wife and his two teenage children, he choked up. If my son asks for something and I can't give it to him, I just can't handle it. A high school teacher who worked for 41 years to earn a pension that was almost worthless, a 70-year-old taxi driver who was terrified his car would need repairs and he couldn't afford it, an electrical engineer educated in the Soviet Union who recalled waiting in fuel lines there and was furious that she now had to do it in her own country. Those with foreign passports or marketable skills are rushing to leave the country as fast as they can. Before the crisis, Ahmad El Awanyi had been on the path to a comfortable life in Beirut with a job as a pharmacist at a private hospital and a teaching position at a university. One recent morning, he arrived near dawn to get gas and waited in line for four hours, making him late for work. His pharmacy often lacked blood pressure meds and even painkillers and antibiotics, something that never happened before. He accepted a new job in the UAE where his salary would be ten times as high and he wouldn't have to wait to fill a tank. The currency crash has made it more expensive for traders to import medications and subsidy payments from the central bank aimed at keeping medication coming in have been delayed, causing shortages. A mother came in vain searching for acne medication for one son and prescription eye drops for another. A bank manager had failed to find any of the five medications his doctor had recommended his sister take for COVID-19. And a couple said they'd been to nine pharmacies without finding epilepsy medication for the wife and drugs for Parkinson's disease that the man's mother had been taking for decades. Eli Huri managed to find only two of the five drugs his doctor had recommended to treat the cluster headaches that attacked him nightly and kept him awake. So far, he had asked only at pharmacies within walking distance of the clothing store he managed because his wife was low on gas but he worried that he wouldn't find painkillers before pharmacies close for the day. If I don't find them, I'll just have to deal with the pain. I feel that um, Lebanon is the canary in the coal mine of what's going to happen to many nations as the dollar milkshake theory takes place. Uh, lack of faith in a domestic currency begins to happen. It begins to inflate against the dollar. As it inflates against the dollar, inputs become more expensive. Imports become more expensive. As imports become more expensive, their own currency diminishes. Uh, more forex traders short the currency, the currency further devaluates, then it falls into hyperinflation, and then the nation falls into collapse. 
This is going to be exacerbated by climate change. This is going to be exacerbated by water wars. This is going to be exacerbated by lithium mining, by development into a 21st century modern world. And I've been telling people that this is going to be happening. I mean, we covered this almost almost two years ago now when, when they depegged uh, the pound from the dollar. Uh, you can see this happening in Iran uh, to some extent. It will take place in Afghanistan, Sudan, maybe Ethiopia, Turkey even, uh, Lebanon. Uh, eventually Jordan is going to have to depeg their dollar. They have the Jordanian dinar pegged to the dollar for some reason, but that's not going to last. Um, Zaire, Zimbabwe, Nigeria. Th um, this really is, uh, this is what our decade is going to be like, in my opinion. I mean, I think I can prove it, but it is still my opinion. Does anybody have any questions here or thoughts? Okay. That's not really what hurt um that's not really what hurt Lebanon. Lebanon, like a lot of the global economy is dependent on remittance payments from migrant workers sending money back home or from expats sending money back home. So it really, I, I think that it still all comes back to everything being needed to be purchased in dollars. This is, th this really d gets into that dollar milkshake theory where emerging market economies cannot afford their imports because the imports are paid for in dollars and then they devalue and they inflate against that. And then once you begin the spiral, you don't, you cannot come back from that. I, I haven't figured out a way for an inflating currency to stop inflating. I think the Argentinian peso, I mean, even the Brazilian reais is doing it at the moment. Um, it happened with the Venezuelan uh, currency, the Bolivar. Uh, it's probably part of the reason that Ecuador is uh, shifting to Bitcoin as payments. Uh, but Lebanon was unsustainable for a long time due to always relying on those remittance payments from uh, expats to just send money back in to keep the central bank coffers full of dollars. So actually, I mean, you've got you've got a little bit of a thing there. Um, yeah, if you subsidize certain things, okay, it's going to lead to, you know, a potential collapse in the end. But I'm I'm still, oh, I don't know. I don't know how to fix some of these things. I really don't. Chicago-based Nature's Find has meatless breakfast patties and dairy-free cream cheese hitting grocery stores later they use shelves and other meatless products. Y oh, sorry, El Salvador. My bad. Yeah. Ecuador is pegged to the dollar still, so that's going to collapse, right? Doesn't Ecuador actually use the dollars? Yeah, I mean they could have been, but they had, but they really had bigger problems than those. Really, the biggest problem that Lebanon had was pegging the currency to the dollar. Um, th this was like there's there there are cascading effects of other things that happened, but I I want to I just want to impart like my position here that the biggest problem is that aspect that you have forex traders going around shorting different international currencies and shorting different sovereign debt, then when the sovereign debt you know, shorts, then the yield on that goes up, then the government has to pay, you know, 2%, 5%, 10%, 20%. Uh, then you lead to capital controls. I mean, Greece had the capital controls during the Eurozone crisis. Lebanon has capital controls. Turkey had capital controls. So I, I, I'm more, I'm, I'm more want to kind of make the case that uh, a lot of stripping of resources from these nations have been done, and that doesn't really leave them with anything.
kind of. We, we need them to get more dollars, though, so I don't know how to get... Uh, I, I don't know how to fix this. Well, I mean, I don't exactly know how to fix the global dollar system. Because then this ties into all the euro dollar research that we do with Jeff Snyder and Emil Kalinowski and Euro Dollar University with Alhambra Investments. And it ties into Brent Johnson and his dollar milkshake theory that, like, also, in my opinion, during the next global financial crisis, when there is an equity sell-off, when there is a potential asset sell-off of homes, then you're going to get a treasury bond sell-off. And as all of these things sell off, then there's probably going to be a need for dollars to pay any of the debts that are outstanding. So people are going to rush to try to actually get physical dollars on the Forex markets. And I think that when that happens, then you're going to have a continued devaluation of international currencies against the dollar. Um, and then we really, like, well, our next one is really going to be the, uh, the big one. No, it technically can become stronger in a strange turn of events. It can actually become stronger because every time that a every time that a debt gets created or credit gets issued, it requires more dollars to pay it back than dollars that exist. So anytime a bank loan goes out, anytime a mortgage gets created, anytime a car loan goes out, anytime a business loan goes out, you're consistently creating more debt that needs to be paid back, but there's not enough dollars to pay that back. So eventually, sometime, someday, you first go into a liquidity crisis, then you go into a solvency crisis because there's no way for you to pay back those debts. Exactly. There are 13 people standing in one chair. Right. Yeah. And also, I mean, uh, written backwards and Montreal player, memo for the record, Alatia Tanera, uh, Bugsy, anybody else that's out there check me on what I'm saying. I could 100% be wrong. Uh, I could 80% be wrong. I could 80% be right. I could 100% be right. Um, so I, I, I usually don't talk if I haven't done research on topics. So I stay away from a lot of things. And I, I have some research on these areas. But go around and check me, please. Climate change will affect every aspect of our lives, including the buildings we live and work in. Most people in the United States, for example, spend 90% of their time indoors. Climate change is fundamentally altering the environment conditions in which these buildings are designed to function. Some changes like higher average air temperatures and humidity will become permanent. What were once previously considered once in a century floods may become a regular occurrence. Houses will be more prone to overheating, putting the lives of the residents at risk. The heat dome over North America, flooding will happen more often and inundate greater areas. Termites and melting asphalt. More intense wind and rain will cause external cladding to deteriorate more rapidly and leak more often. Higher temps will expand the regions where insects can live. That includes timber-eating termites that can cause major structural damage or malaria-carrying mosquitoes, which living spaces must be redesigned to protect us from. If you all remember uh, earlier, Yellowstone National Park is predicting more and more invasive species as the temperature has changed a little bit, and we were just covering the whole grasshopper problem. So there's a problem in the United States at the moment where grasshoppers do better in dry, hot conditions. So as the grassland birds have uh, died off, as the grassland fields have died off, the grasshopper population doesn't have any natural predators. It's exploding massively and rapidly. And then the grasshoppers are out there out eating the cattle. So a lot of Western cattle farmers and Western agricultural producers have sold off part of their livestock 
because the livestock isn't able to compete with the exploding grasshopper population. So the United States is now going to spray 2.6 million fucking acres or some kind of shit, which is the equivalent of the size of Rhode Island and Delaware together in the state of Montana to try to kill the grasshopper nymphs. Uh, but invasive species is a big concern of a lot of different places at the moment. Materials expand as they get hotter, especially metals, which can cause them to buckle once their design tolerance is exceeded. For one skyscraper in Shenzhen, China, high temperatures were partially blamed for causing the structure to shake, forcing its evacuation as the steel frame stretched in the heat. Extreme temperatures can even cause materials to melt, resulting in roads bleeding as the surface layer of bitumen softens. Mm, interesting biohaz. Also interesting, Alatia. Forex shorting has been around for a long time. I don't know when it began, but I know it's been around for a while. And not only can you short Forex, but you can short uh, sovereign bonds. So you can short a nation's currency and you can short their debt. And as more and more shorts pile in, it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Subsidence, when the ground below a structure gives way, causing it to crack or collapse, is also expected to happen more often in a warmer world. Buildings with foundations and clay soils are particularly vulnerable, as the soils swell when they absorb water, then harden and shrink as they dry out. Changing rainfall patterns will exacerbate this. Over the next 50 years, for example, more than 10% of properties in Britain will be affected by subsist subsidence. There you go, um, Biohaz. Thank you so much for the donation uh, today, Biohaz. You, uh, like I said, you're the one that got me to touch my first B-frame ever, which uh, everybody, don't do what I did when you're going to catch B-frames. Uh, I was wearing a t-shirt and shorts <laughs> and no protective uh, gear and bee frames out of a beehive. Don't do that. I was very, very scared. Concrete cancer. Uh, we were talking about this earlier today. I've got a tweet out there right now, everybody. That, uh, here. The amount of money needed to fix existing infrastructure in the United States stands at roughly $6 trillion, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers. That number does not include homes, offices, and other private buildings. So there is a big, uh, problem at the moment right now. Uh, that um, our concrete only lasts for like 50 to 100 years anymore and you can't really tell if it's bad until you get inside of it. Um, a warmer climate, a warmer wetter climate will play havoc with the durability of the material when the steel inside it gets wet and rusts and expands cracking the concrete and weakening the structure in a process sometimes referred to as concrete cancer. So you can't even tell that it's happened because you can't see it from the outside. Buildings in coastal areas are especially susceptible as the chloride in salt water accelerates rusting. And I mean, you all saw the absolutely horrific tragedy that just happened in Miami. It's going to be, I mean, it's partly involved with this, I would have to assume. Rising sea levels will raise the water table and make it saltier, affecting building foundations, while salt spray will further spread will spread further on stronger winds. At the same time, the concrete is affected by carbonation, a process where carbon dioxide from the air reacts with cement to form a chemical element, calcium carbonate, lowers the pH of the concrete, making the steel even more prone to corrosion. Since the 50s, global CO2 levels have increased from 300 parts per million to 415. More CO2 means more carbonation. The tragic recent collapse of an apartment building in Miami in the U.S. may be an early warning of the process gaining speed, while the exact cause of the collapse is still being investigated, some are suggesting it could be linked to climate change. Yeah, right. Uh, buildings don't fall down in the United States. 
Okay, uh, I've got about like four or five more articles in me here until I kind of have some plans for the afternoon potentially. Well, I'm waiting to hear back from somebody about afternoon plans, so I've got a little bit more time. As China's foreign currency deposits pass one trillion, banks face an unwanted headache, yuan pressure. China's also seeing a rise in capital inflows from other channels which countries to place unwanted upwards pressure on the yuan exchange rate. Okay, so one dollar only gets you 6.46 you won. And I know China's a lot happier when it's around the seven mark is kind of where they like to be. Because if the yuan gets more expensive for international currency, so also think about it this way. Okay, so look at this, uh, look at this drop. So you were, let's just say that you were in this middle range. You're at like a... One dollar gets you seven point one yuan. Now imagine that you're Beirut. So your currency was not only inflating against the dollar, but it's inflated even further against the yuan. So a a strong yuan also makes goods and services more expensive for everybody that buys from China. For China that means people are gonna buy less goods and services. For the rest of the world it just means that their services are gonna get more expensive to purchase from China. Hello, preachings. The strength of the yuan rose to a three-year high in June <coughs> could potentially invite speculative risky behavior based on an outlook for further yuan appreciation. Investors rushing to convert their foreign currency holdings into yuan could lead to a self-strengthening cycle between forex conversion and yuan appreciation. Uh, no, we're just talking regular, regular yuan. Yeah, it was just a pretty short article. Uh, okay, so this one I cannot open. I did want to cover this one. We got... We're going to get almost through everything that I wanted to. Uh, you've missed a lot. I've been streaming for three hours, and I've covered like 50 stories. A tribe becomes a key water player with a drought aid to Arizona. A key Colorado River reservoir is at its lowest level since it was filled in the 1930s. An Arizona tribe for thousands of years relied on the Colorado River's natural floodplains to farm. Later, it hand dug ditches and canals to route water to the fields. Now gravity sends the river water from the north end of the Colorado River Indian Tribes Reservation through 19th century canals to sustain alfalfa, cotton, wheat, onions, and potatoes. Some of them haven't been producing lately as the tribe can contributes water to prop up Lake Mead to help weather a historic drought. The reservoir serves as a barometer for how much water Arizona and other states will get under plans to protect the river, serving 40 million people. We were always told more or less what to do, and so now it's taking shape where tribes have been involved and invited to the table to do negotiations to have input into the issues about the river. Water experts say the situation would be worse had the tribe not agreed to store 150,000 acre feet in the lake over three years. A single acre foot is enough to serve one to two households per year. 
the Gila River Indian community also contributed water. They received $38 million in return, including $30 million from the state. Environmentalist foundations and corporations fulfilled a pledge last month to chip in the rest. Tribal officials say that $38 million is more than what they would have made leasing the land. The Colorado River Indian tribe stopped farming more than 15 square miles to make water available. They're going to use the money to invest in water infrastructure, they say. A 2016 study conducted by the tribe put the price tag to fix deficiencies at more than $75 million. It's leveraging grants, funding from previous conservation efforts, and other money to put a dent in the repairs. Some of the water, while going to farming, also sustained wildlife preserves and the tribe's culture. We can't forget about the spiritual, the cultural aspect to the tribes on the Colorado River, our songs, our clan songs, river, and other traditional rites that happen at that river. Sinopec builds China's first large carbon capture sequestration project. China started building the country's first large-scale carbon capture utilization and storage project as part of a larger target to be carbon neutral by 2050. Okay, so they're trying to make blue hydrogen. Wait, how did I, how did I change stories? I kind of want to talk about the blue hydrogen though too. Sinopec said yesterday that the project at the Shegli oil field in East China would be the first of its kind and have a storage capacity of 1 million tons. It'll capture carbon dioxide emissions that result from hydrogen production at Sinopec's Kilu refinery in eastern Shandong province. It will then be injected into 73 oil wells where it will be used to boost oil production. They estimated that 10.68 million tons of CO2 will be injected in the oil field over the next 15 years and lift oil production by nearly 3 million tons. So you're using carbon to just get more oil out of the ground. I... okay. <laughs> okay. I have to read more about this one. I'm uh, trying to like condense, and I'm really doing stories short at the end here because I, I got places to get going soon. Yeah, I um, um, that's uh, I, I'm happy that you're doing your research on those things. It's just I'm I'm very well down the rabbit hole, and um, my thoughts are pretty formulated on it. And I don't like talking about it all the time because it just I've talked about it so many times, and it, it's just a. Uh, I'm happy that you're doing your research. Uh, I've got my thoughts on all of it. And I just it irritates me to keep rehashing them. I'm going to have to come back to this one tomorrow because I don't have enough time to read a uh, huge deep dive article. Uh, so I think we have, uh, we got through a good amount of them. We had 88 open. I think we're probably going to end up getting through like 60 of them today. So the end of California's groundwater free-for-all. Meters are now being used to measure farmers' water use in the Golden State. They're planning to require flow meters on agricultural wells, part of a landmark effort to measure and constrain pumping that used to be free and unlimited. It's a controversial step aimed at protecting water supplies that could change cultivation practices in the Golden State's thirsty fields.
Under the state's tough new groundwater protection law, we now have a legal obligation to manage our groundwater sustainably, and we cannot manage it without with such large uncertainties in water use. Since California's early rough and tumble frontier days, the ability to pump water from a private well on personal property has been an agricultural birthright. If you owned the land, the thinking went, you own the water under it. So while cities charge residents based on the amount of water they use, rural well owners did not need to report or measure their pumping. Even as aquifers drained, causing the land to sink and seawater to intrude, well meters were fighting words. The only way for officials to gauge pumping was to take aerial photos or track electricity consumption. But the 2014 Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, pronounced SIGMA, changes all that. It was adopted during the state's last devastating drought when farmers relied on their wells for survival and pumped from aquifers like never before. The law asserts that groundwater is a shared resource. While it upholds a farmer's right to pump, it imposes rules on its use. For the first time in California history, managers of the state's most 100 state's 140 most overdrawn groundwater basins must balance the amount of water being pumped from and recharged into aquifers by 2040. It allows increased pumping during drought only if no major problems result. <coughs> Growers are billed $246 an acre foot, the equivalent of an acre of water one foot deep. In four years, fees are going to increase to $346 per acre foot. It's going to make our food uh, rise in cost. I'm, I'm not against it. I'm just saying it's going to. A handful of farms have refused access. Their bills are estimated with stiff penalties added. Pai Shoto estimates he pays nearly a million dollars a year for water, and it used to be free. It's not unusual for us to have between 30 or 40 bills for water show up on the same day in a big brown vanilla envelope. It's a hard check to sign. Among the old timers, there's still lingering resistance. A lot of people think, hey, we own the land, we own the water. In SoCal, nut producer Mojave Pistachio says the fees are so high, $2,100 per acre foot of water, that it may be forced to abandon a $35 million investment in trees. Wow. Tough times are coming ahead this decade, everybody. Teach yourself skills, if you can, if you're able. Um, all right, so I think I might leave these for tomorrow. So to Tomorrow we might have JP, we might have, uh, well, okay, we did that one. We did this one too. What would I say to the idea that our taxes should go towards subsidized farms that create and supply free food for those who are interested? Um, I would rather buy out the technology that these indoor vertical farms are doing 
and develop a lot of indoor vertical farms. That way everybody can get food then try to go like piecemeal into that system, I guess. Yeah, I would, I, I guess my main answer is I would rather try to think bigger than thinking on that small of a scale. No, it would be, um, it would be a not-for-profit run farm. Like I, I want to buy out IP and build a lot of non-profit, um, like kind of public, public farms. I would say, and then have the people that work at those farms be public uh, pension employees. I would think. Um, we actually got through most of everything that I wanted to today. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We only missed 15 out of all the different tabs that we had. Uh, so this was actually a pretty good one. Uh, what I am going to do is this. Okay, so there's our one tab. There is the page that I want. Okay, so... There's that link for everybody. Okay, um, announcements once again. Well, thank you, Biohaz, for hey, I can't believe I'm about to say these numbers a $125 donation. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I am going to be leaving for Nebraska on Thursday. I'll be back in the office here tomorrow. Um, I just have to get going now, but there will be a big office stream tomorrow. I'm going to be putting up some YouTube videos tonight, so check out that kind of stuff if you want to. I think today was an actually damn good stream. I would even give us uh, maybe an A. Today might be an A stream. Wait, Ben is streaming again? Interesting. He cut short for something. Okay, well, then I'll help him out and I'll give him his viewers back. Uh, yeah, thank you all for a good one today. Uh, the learning will resume tomorrow. Have a nice day. I am going to eat. I'm a bit parched and hungry. All right. Uh, thanks, all. You're great. Uh, yeah, the, the VOD was good. Uh, uh, K variable. <laughs>